Decaffeinated Scandal, a Killer Coffee Mystery Series, written by Tanya Kappas, narrated by Christina Sagnameni. One. It looks like you're going to be ready after all. I stood on the steps of the Cocoon Inn with one hand gripping a commercial coffee carafe and the other holding a to-go bean hive coffee house box filled with lunch lady brownie bars. I'm not sure, but Kami sure is working me like crazy. I'm not sure there are enough hours in the day, but I'm doing my best. Newton Oakley hunched over the flower bed next to the front steps, digging up enough dirt to place an orange mum. Pepper, my curious little schnauzer, was standing next to him, watching his every move. Newton sat back on his haunches, took his gloves off, and gave Pepper a few scratches under his salt and pepper beard. I think we're all working hard to make sure this year's Nuwala Festival is the best yet. The name of our three-day fall festival, Halloween Backwards, still did not roll off my tongue easily. It was something I was going to have to learn to say since making the small, quaint town of Honey Springs, Kentucky, my new home. You be sure you grab a cup of coffee this morning. It's a new fall blend that I'm sure you're going to love. I'll have to come in and warm up after I get this row of mums planted. He gestured over his shoulders at the orange, yellow, and red mums sitting in the leafy green grass behind him, ready to be planted. Good morning. Kami Montgomery met me at the top of the steps. There was a plaid blanket draped over her forearm. Let me throw this on a rocking chair and I'll help you. The sound of Kami's voice made Pepper dart up the steps. My nosy little dog loved everyone, but he particularly loved Kami. She was the treat lady. I've got it, I protested, but she'd already put the blanket over one of the many white rocking chairs lining the large plantation porch. Don't be silly. She pushed her long red hair over one shoulder and took the box from me. I can't risk you dropping my box of goodies, she laughed and nodded towards the door. Every time I walk in here, it still takes my breath away. Pepper and I stepped into the white mansion, built circa 1841, that was situated right on Lake Honey Springs, and I turned around to look out one of the floor-to-ceiling windows that offered guests a spectacular view. Yeah, I'm so lucky, she said, reaching into the bowl of dog treats that she kept on the counter for the furry guests that accompanied their families. Yes, you are. I heard the familiar voice of Walker Peevler, Honey Spring's most recent transplant. Walker! I couldn't stop smiling while he and Kami embraced into a sweet kiss on the lips. I've not seen you in a while, but I've seen Amelia. I can't believe how she's grown. Walker had been a single man with custody of his granddaughter. He'd stolen Kami's heart while staying at the Cocoon Inn. Since he had a sales job and traveled all the time, he could live anywhere. It truly was a perfect union. He and Kami were both in their fifties, and Honey Springs was a fantastic place to raise a child. If you didn't know their backstory and saw Walker, Kami, and Amelia out and about around town, you'd never know that Amelia wasn't Kami's biological granddaughter. The only thing the three of them did not share was the same last name. Kami had decided to keep her last name when they got married, due to her business and how much time it'd take to get all the documents changed. Amelia sure is something special. He leaned back and looked into the hospitality room. She's going to be late for school if she doesn't hurry up. She's eating her oatmeal. Run upstairs and grab her coat. Kami shooed him off to their living quarters in the inn. I followed her into the hospitality room, where I replaced the commercial coffee carafe with a new one. The focal point of the room was a large, beautiful fireplace directly across from the entryway. A few snaps and pops filled the room as the wood crackled in the fireplace, making the unseasonably cool morning cozy and the room very inviting. Roxy! Pepper! Amelia jumped up from the small cafe table and ran over to greet us. Did you see my pumpkin? She giggled as Pepper gave her a sweet kiss along her nose. I didn't, but I know without seeing it that it's going to win the pumpkin carving contest. I bent down and gave her a hug. Pepper demanded one, too, so of course I gave him one. Your granddaddy went to grab your coat, so you better eat up before you're late for school. 
Kami gave Amelia a scrub on the head with her fingertips, sending her back to the table. She's more excited about the pumpkins than her costume. To be a kid again. I laughed and took the box of brownie bars from Kami. I'll get these arranged, and then I've got to get back. I left Bunny alone. Oh, dear. Kami and I both knew my senior citizen assistant, Bunny Bowowski, wasn't the best person to leave alone. I hope the beanhive is still standing when you get back. Both of us laughed, me a little more nervously than her. Let's go, Squirt. Walker took the lightweight coat with an extended arm, summoning Amelia. Don't forget to look at my pumpkin, she reminded me as they darted past us. Love you, Mama, she called to Kami. Bye, Pepper. I love you, too. Have a great day, Kami called out to Amelia. Come down to the coffee house later, and I'll let you take Pepper for a walk. I waved goodbye. I will, Amelia said with a giggle, and waved over her granddad as he lifted her in the air and placed her over his shoulder. I'm so happy for you, I said to Kami as I arranged the brownies on a three-tiered platter. You look so happy and content. I am, and I can't wait for you to join us. She peeked around my arm and reached for a brownie. Have you and Patrick set a date yet? We have plans to meet that Justice of the Peace, Brandy Cliff. The thought of marrying Patrick Kane sent a wave of joy through my body that I never thought I would experience. I had been married once before, and it wasn't pretty. I knew when he asked me to marry him, something was off when I didn't get the giggles and squeals. But with Patrick, I instantly knew the first time I saw him, and that was when we were teens. Life went on and we ended up losing touch. Here we were, eleven years later, and as happy as could be. I told him it was fine for Brandy to perform the ceremony, like she did for you and Walker. I've gone through one marriage and another lifetime to get back to Honey Springs. So any way I become Roxanne Bloom Kane is perfect for me. I smacked Kami's hand away when she went for another brownie. If you don't stop, your customers aren't going to get any. It's crazy. I've been craving chocolate and I just can't get enough of your fresh baked goodies. She licked her lips and brushed her hands together. I better get to work before I lose my customers. You're not going to lose anyone. Not only do they love you, but you're the only place for them to stay during the Niwala Festival. I picked up the empty coffee carafe and followed her out to the entrance. Not from what I hear. She shook her head with a frown on her face. What did you hear? Apparently, the gossip hadn't gotten to me yet, which was unusual. There's been this guy snooping around the courthouse and PVA office about land near or on Honey Springs Lake, asking about how the economy is each season. She gnawed on the edge of her lip as she referred to the Property Valuation Administration office. A guy? I questioned. There are a lot of tourists that come into the beanhive asking about our small town, but it was just chit-chat. I'd chalk it up to just being nosy. Her brows pulled. Some property along the lake over at Bee Farm. The Bee Farm? The more she talked, the more confused I got. Ask around today. She leaned over and whispered as a mom and dad and their little boy walked up to the check-in desk. It wasn't the whispering that made me want to call my mom right away, but the quick head nod Kami had gestured towards the family standing inside her inn. My mom was a local realtor, so maybe she'd heard. Have a good day, Roxy, Newton called as I hurried down the steps to get back to the coffee house. He'd only gotten a couple more mums planted. Bye, I yelled with a ton of questions in my mind about the possibility of the bee farm selling its land. Come on, Pepper. Two. Why the long face? asked Bunny as she waddled up to me at the bar top along the front of the bean hive. When I moved to Honey Springs after my divorce, Aunt Maxie decided I was going to open a coffee house since I had always loved coffee and all things related to the magical bean. I was lucky to find a prime location in the middle of Lake Honey Springs boardwalk. The windows along the front of the shop were perfect for a long bar top with stools so customers could enjoy the amazing views Kentucky offered each season. Don't tell me you and Patrick are having issues. There was concern in her voice. No, not at all. I held the warm mug of coffee between my hands, my elbows propped up on the bar. 
I barely swiveled the stool and glanced at her. When I delivered the coffee and goodies for Kami's hospitality room, she mentioned that the bee farm might be selling off some land. I'm not sure why that'd be on your mind. Bunny used the edge of her apron to wipe down some of the bar. The bean hive, the cocoon inn, and the bee's knees, all the shops in Honey Springs count on our abundance of bees. The bee farm is our primary tourist destination. Visitors love taking the ferry from the marina, spending the day learning about the bees, and getting fresh honey. There was a pit of sadness in my stomach. If the bee farm sells some of its land, what will happen to the bees? Well, I didn't think about that. Bunny unpinned the bobby pin she'd put next to her ear to keep her gray, chin-length bob out of her face and repositioned it. She also took the opportunity to adjust the shawl that she wore over her apron. I reckon you're going to need to look into that. I guess. Not that I could really do anything about it. If Andrew and Kayla Nora wanted to sell, they could sell. But if they sell it, it would be a great place for a resort. I murmured to myself as I took the last sip of coffee from the mug and glanced over the boardwalk and across the lake at the bee farm, which was an island in Lake Honey Springs. Sometimes it was nice to go to the marina and get ferried over for a late afternoon visit to the bee farm, tasting the samples or just hiking the nature trails. I can't worry about that right now. I got off the stool and looked around the coffee house. The breakfast rush had come and gone. Soon we'd see the lunch crowd. Though we were a coffee house, I kept items on the menu to appeal to everyone. The bean hive was located in the middle of the boardwalk, right across from the pier. The exposed brick walls and wooden ceiling beams were already there when I decided to take Aunt Maxie up on her offer and rent the building from her. I wanted the coffee house to be as adorable as Wild and Whimsy Antiques, Walk in the Bark Pet Boutique, the Crooked Cat Bookstore, and Buzz In and Out Diner, to name a few of the other shops along the boardwalk. I'd watched a few DIY videos on YouTube to learn how to make the coffee house exactly what I wanted. I couldn't be more pleased with the shiplap wall I'd created out of plywood painted white. I bought the four large chalkboards that were hanging from the ceiling over the L-shaped glass countertop. The first chalkboard menu was over the pie counter and listed the pies and cookies with their prices. The second menu was above the torts and quiches. The third menu, before the L-shaped counter curved, listed the breakfast casseroles and specialty drinks. The fourth and last chalkboard displayed lunch options and catering information. There was a coffee bar at one end of the counter and a tea bar at the opposite end. Both operated on the honor system. Customers who wanted regular brewed coffee could fill their own mugs or cups and drop their payment in a mason jar I provided. I made sure to keep regular coffee and some specialty blends stocked and refreshed in commercial coffee carafes. The tea bar was the same, only I also provided antique teapots from Wild and Whimsy. There were different blends of tea in bags as well as a glass jar of loose tea. All the honey was purchased from the bee farm, and I sure didn't want to have to buy products for the coffee house that weren't local. I've got to get lunch on. The crackle of the fireplace caught my attention. I walked over to add a few more logs to last the rest of the afternoon and couldn't resist the urge to fluff up the pillows made from coffee bean sacks that were scattered all over the couches. When I looked up, the slim tree I'd set up in the corner of the coffee house made me smile. It was covered with twinkling lights and a combination of fall and coffee-themed ornaments. There were even a few that resembled shops here on the boardwalk, and the thought of someone from the outside building something here, like Kami said, made me sad. My heart sank when I looked at the cute honey pots from the bee farm. My eyes shifted to the cafe tables dotting the inside of the shop. They were decorated with fresh-cut swamp sunflowers and garden mums in beautiful fall colors from Jean Hill's garden in milk glass vases of all shapes and sizes from Wild and Whimsy. It was what a shop owner in a small town did, support the other shops in town, and the bee farm kept us in honey. I glanced across the lake at the island and blinked when a couple of tourists on rental bikes rode by along the boardwalk. Earth to Roxy! Bunny waved the dry broom handle in front of my face. It's almost time for dinner and you've still got the northern beans boiling. That's right. I snapped out of my thoughts. I'm not going to get a thing done if I don't stop this daydreaming. Dinner around here was what most people referred to as lunch. 
Then we had supper, which most of the world called dinner. Southern was a way of life. You had to be born into it, not transplanted, and I wondered if this guy who was snooping around Honey Springs had realized this yet. Come on, Pepper. I called Pepper to come back to the kitchen with me while I took the beans off the stove and added celery, carrots, onions, and a bay leaf along with a nice big ham hock. It wasn't too long before I heard a familiar voice screeching my name. Roxanne, where are you? Loretta Beebe pushed through the kitchen door with her pocketbook swinging from the crook of her arm. Her short hair was as black as a midnight sky and matched her brows. Good Lord, Aunt Maxie pushed through after her. Loretta, if you don't stop with the fake and bake, your skin's gonna be the same color as L'Oreal Black Excellence Cream you keep pasting on that hair. Are you crazy, Maxine Bloom? Loretta dug her glittery long nails into the edges of her hair. This is natural, and I am Cherokee. She tugged up the sleeve of her sweater and rotated her arm around so Aunt Maxie could take a gander at all sides. Purebred Cherokee. Unless the fake and bake beds down at the salon are made by a company called Cherokee, then you ain't real Cherokee. Aunt Maxie wasn't going to let it go. Look at you! Loretta did the unthinkable. She pointed at Aunt Maxie. That hair of yours is all stuck up around your head like a bird's nest. She curled up on her tiptoes and tried to get a look at the top of Aunt Maxie's head. Are you delivering a bird from the pet palace for Louise? Don't you be going around pointing no finger at me, Aunt Maxie glared at her. You two, it's almost dinner time, and I've got to get this bean and ham soup done. I don't have time to fuss with you. I grabbed the white pepper and put a dash in each pot of soup. What do y'all want? My, my, Aunt Maxie drew up her hand to her chest. Someone's testy today. She nudged Loretta with her elbow. Seems to be. Loretta and Aunt Maxie had now turned on me. I guess I've got a lot on my mind, and I've got too many things to do without trying to cram my brain with you two. I gestured my wooden spoon between them before I stirred each pot, combining all the ingredients. What's on your mind? Loretta dragged one of the steel stools up to the kitchen's island workstation, with Aunt Maxie quickly doing the same. We are all ears. Hold on. Aunt Maxie took her coat off and hung it on one of the hooks. I'm going to grab us some coffee. I'll be right back. While she's gone, I wanted to make sure we were all set for the Halloween treats for the animals that you said you'd donate during the Niwala Festival. Loretta, that's how she pronounced her own name with a deep southern drawl, said, They are on my list. I used the wooden spoon to point to the whiteboard on the wall. It was where I kept the weekly orders and weekly menu. Catering wasn't something I'd thought about when I opened the bean hive, but it had been a wonderful side hustle that brought in extra income during the off-season, which made me think about the bee farm again. Had they had an off-season with the bees? When Aunt Maxie returned to the kitchen with cups of coffee and blueberry scones, it dawned on me how I could get her out of my hair for the day. I've got a story for you to investigate for your sticky situation article in the newspaper. I've been looking for a good scoop. She'd recently started writing the gossip column for the Honey Springs Tribune. I figured I'd just do a piece on the festival. I mean, all those cute little kids and the fur kids, she said in her smooshy pepper voice, and she pinched off a piece of scone for him. My loud sigh that told her I didn't approve of her giving him some went unnoticed. She clearly didn't care because she gave him another pinch. Pepper, down. I pointed to his bed and walked over to the island, leaning my hip on it. Kami told me there was a man in town asking around, possibly looking to purchase land on the bee farm. Interesting. Aunt Maxie dug into the hippie bag she had slung over her shoulder. Tell me more. She had her little notebook and pen out, ready to take notes. That's all I know. What does this mean for the honey festival? Loretta's voice dripped with concern, almost on the verge of tears. No one is going to take the festival away from me now that I'm the president. 
I wish you'd shut up about being the president of the beautification committee. Aunt Maxie dropped her pen. You act like you're Honey Springs royalty or something. You won because nobody else wanted to do it. Aunt Maxie could be a bit harsh at times, but that was one of the things I liked about her. She spoke the truth. Maxine Bloom? Loretta bolted up. I don't know why I even thought we could enjoy a cup of coffee together. You have no manners. She jerked her pocketbook back on her arm. The only culture that you will ever know is a yeast infection. Loretta stormed out of the kitchen, leaving me and Aunt Maxie with our jaws dropped plumb down to the ground. The nerve! Aunt Maxie lifted her chin and set aside Loretta's jab. What was it you were saying about the bee farm? There's not much to say. She just said someone was snooping around. I opened the door to the walk-in freezer and took out pumpkin and cinnamon cookies along with a couple apple honey pies. You mean to tell me this is just hearsay? Her nose curled. I'm saying exactly what she told me. I turned the ovens on to 350 degrees, the right temperature to warm the cookies and the pies. Don't you think it's something to explore? This ain't much of a scoop for the sticky situation. She stood up and walked back over to get her coat. Sometimes the juice just ain't worth the squeeze. Then she prattled on to tell me how many people come through Honey Springs to see if the small tourist town was a good place to open a shop and retire. Blah, blah, blah. I'd completely tuned her out when the warm smell of cinnamon, baked apples, and pumpkin, along with a hint of honey, circled my head and filled the kitchen with the scents of fall. It was my favorite season, though it wasn't the busiest. Roxy, get on out here. Bunny stuck her head in the door. I glanced up at the clock. It's time for another round. I gave Aunt Maxie a kiss, leaving her in the kitchen while I went to help Bunny take orders. There was a small line of about ten people. Bunny and I both took orders. I smiled at the couple I'd seen earlier at the Cocoon Inn with their son as they stepped up to the counter. Welcome to the Bean Hive. What can I get you? I asked. I'll have a mocha latte with a drizzle of caramel. He'll have a hot chocolate. The woman had a hint of an accent. Upon closer inspection, it appeared she'd been hiding behind her shoulder-length black hair earlier. She was much older than I'd anticipated. She had brown eyes with deep crow's feet. Her thin lips had little wrinkles around them, like she was a smoker, but her uptight outfit told me she was probably much too proper to do so. Ron, the waitress is waiting. She nudged her husband. A light giggle escaped from Bunny as she put her hand up to her lips. Ron was looking all around the ceiling and along the counter as though he were checking the place out. Maybe I was paying way too close attention to him because Kami had pointed them out to me at the inn earlier. I'll have a black coffee. His eyes searched the closest chalkboard. Venti or whatever you've got. We've got one size. Nothing fancy here. I took the opening. I'm Roxanne Bloom, the owner of the beehive. Welcome to Honey Springs. I emphasized the owner. Roxy for short. Bunny stole my line. But I only let my friends call me Roxy. These weren't friendly people. Roxanne is just fine, I corrected Bunny. It wasn't that I was the owner and not a waitress. It was her uppity attitude that got my tall panties all wadded up in my craw. Owner? Ron asked with a curious tone. Honey, I'll wait for your latte. You take Jimmer over to the table to wait. I'm Ron Harvey, and that's Bev, my wife. They took their seats while Bunny made the pressed coffee and shook the whipped cream to put extra foam on the little boy's hot chocolate. How's business this time of year? He asked me, his arms folded. Good. I couldn't quite put my finger on him. Normally, I was great at reading people since I'd been a lawyer in my former life. Technically, I was still a lawyer. I did keep up my license in case I ever did go back. My degrees come in handy a time or two while living here in Honey Springs, after a couple of my friends were wrongly accused of murder. It wasn't that I didn't enjoy being a lawyer. I just liked being the owner of a coffee house much better. I mean, like the flow of customers and tourists in Honey Springs. He talked with his hands, making it hard for me to read him. We're a seasonal tourist town. I knew I should probably keep my mouth shut, 
but I couldn't stop myself. Are you the man snooping around here about the bee farm? I'm a businessman. He looked at me with tired blue eyes, the kind that appeared to be dehydrated and the result of drinking too much, maybe trying to keep up with the younger crowd. And I didn't mean the little boy. I'm always looking for a good place to invest my money, and I believe real estate is it. Thank you. His wife took her latte from Bunny and then handed the boy his hot chocolate. A good investment? Is that right? I handed him his coffee. We believe in community and helping each other. It's not about the almighty dollar. If it were, I'd still be a lawyer. You mean to tell me you make more money brewing coffee than you did being a lawyer? He scoffed. Ron, let's go. His wife walked up. Her face was red. I could tell she was embarrassed by her husband's comment. I'm telling you that you owe me $10.52. There was no humor found on my face. This man was up to something, and I needed to know what it was. 3. Before I even heard the voice, I heard the jingling bracelets after the bell over the coffee house door danged. I hope you brought me a new adoption client. I quickly wiped down the counter, looking over my shoulder. Pepper darted around the counter to see who Louise Carlton from the Pet Palace had brought us and to get some love from Louise. Hello, Pepper. Louise, who was middle-aged, wore a long-sleeved, light blue, knit shirt dress with buttons going up the front. Bracelets and bangles were piled all up and down her right arm. She wore a pair of brown cowboy boots, and her silver bob with blunt bangs was the perfect finishing touch to her style. Pet Palace was our version of an SPCA, and Louise was the owner. Aunt Maxie hooked me up with Louise after I moved to Honey Springs. I'd bought and moved into a rundown cabin on the lake. Aunt Maxie had insisted I needed a guard dog, and I was looking to get a furry companion. When I walked through the kennels at the Pet Palace, I'd passed by Pepper's cage, but Pepper was not going to go unnoticed. In true Pepper style, he yipped and jumped until he got my full attention. As Aunt Maxie liked to say, that was all she wrote. Pepper and I were a team from the get-go. You're gonna love this little one. Louise set the carrier down. Pepper had already dug his nose underneath the small blanket draped over it. This is Norman. P.U. I fanned my hand in front of my face when Louise pulled the blanket off. Norman stinks. Pepper yipped, moved down into downward dog position, and stuck his nose in the cage. Norman growled at Pepper. Pepper took a step back, but continued to wag his little stubby tail. Norman's a pug. He's got gastrointestinal issues. She fussed with her hands as though she was brushing it off. My face was blank. She looked at me, tilting her head with a faint smile. Her arm full of bracelets jingled when she clapped them before dropping them to her stomach. Norman grunted a couple times before expelling more gas. You're gonna take him, right? She brought her hands up in prayer position. You know that I love you, and I love all animals. I sucked in a deep breath. Do you smell that? Louise blinked a few times, her long lashes getting caught in her bangs. She pushed them out of the way. That was the smell of cinnamon, honey, and pumpkin. I drew my shoulders up to my ears. All the smells of fall that give a person all the feels of the season and the upcoming festival. Mix in a little of Norman's toots and we smell like an outhouse. I took him to see Regina Fowler, the vet at the Honey Pot Veterinarian Clinic, and she put him on a special food, pleaded Louise. I pointed behind her toward the door. I've got it in my car, but she said that it'll take a special person to adopt Norman because he will most likely have to be on this special food for the rest of his life, or at least until we can get his system in check. In check, I mumbled. He's in system failure. My eyes met hers. There was a deep look of concern in her eyes. I gave in. Fine, he deserves a home too. Roxy, Louise reached for me. Someone is going to love him and it's going to be all because of you. She put a hand out and twisted her body towards the door. I'll be right back. I'll go grab his information. Hello, Norman. I bent down and looked into the kennel. He was a cute white pug with a few brown splashes. 
His little round black eyes told me he was a little frightened. If you could just hold a few of those little toots in, I'll have you in a forever home in no time. I unlocked the cage, like I normally did with all the animals, so Norman could walk around and get used to his surroundings until someone adopted him. Pepper sat next to the cage, staring at the open door, waiting for Norman to come out. Pepper was used to the routine, since we hosted at least two pets a month. He is a cute feller, I said after I heard the bell over the door ring, thinking it was Louise. More dogs? Ron's wife and their little boy were standing in the doorway of the coffee house. Hi. I put my hands on my knees and pushed myself up to standing, brushing my palms down my apron. I thought you were someone else. But yes, I pointed to the cage. Like I told your husband earlier, we're a very close community and we help each other out. The beehive is kind of a foster family for the animals at the pet palace. The boy with her walked over to the cage and took a look at Norman. I think that all animals should have homes. And if I can show potential pet owners how the animal will act in an environment other than a dog shelter or a kennel, they're more apt to imagine what the animal would be like in their home. I looked back down at Norman with a fresh set of eyes. Norman has some special needs, but we're working with a local veterinarian to help him. Norman poked his head out. He had little black circles around his eyes, his ears stuck straight up, and there was the pinkest skin around his black nose and black lips. He's so cute! The little boy's voice escalated, sending Norman back into the cage. Mimi, can we keep him? No, Jimmer. We have your pawpaw. The uptight lady made a joke, and I couldn't help but laugh out loud. This is your grandson? I asked, which made sense, because I'd noticed earlier she and Ron were much too old to have a child of this age. I went ahead and made my way around the counter to finish making fresh pots of coffee for the afternoon crowd before the afternoon staff came in. Bunny Bowowski left after the lunch crowd every day, leaving me here alone for a few hours. I didn't mind. I was able to clean, refill, restock, and bake some items for the next day. Yes, step-grandson. He's been staying with us for the summer. She moseyed up to the counter. My husband, Ron, who you met earlier. I couldn't help but notice how she rolled her eyes. He and his daughter have a very volatile relationship. She's a grown woman who can't pay her bills, but I blame Ron for that. I'm so glad you get to see your grandson. Apparently, this woman needed an ear to listen. This was what I loved about coffee. It brought people together. It opened doors for conversation, and many problems had been solved over cups of this magical drink. It's not been easy, she groaned, and looked over at him trying to coax Norman out of the cage. I'm not used to little kids, and when Ron told me that we were going to keep him so his mother could work all summer long, I knew he meant that I was going to have to take care of him. I'm sure he's enjoying it. There was just enough coffee in one of the carafes for two cups. I got out two mugs and put them on the counter and grabbed a few ingredients before I filled them. It's been a rough summer. This is our last week with Jimmer, Ron planned to come here for business, and it just so happened that you're having your little Niwala festival. The perfect opportunity for him to say he did something with us this summer before Jimmer goes home. There was a little bitterness in her tone. You are staying in the right place since the festival takes place on the beach in front of the Cocoon Inn. I drizzled at least two teaspoons of caramel syrup, maybe a smidgen more, in the bottom of each mug, along with a couple tablespoons of half and half and a dash of salt. Oh, if you don't have a costume, be sure to check out all about the details. I glanced up at the time as I filled each mug, remembering the appointment Patrick and I had tonight with Babette. Babette Cliff is renting costumes for very cheap. I'm sure she's got plenty left. I grabbed one of the Honey Springs Boardwalk brochures that had a map with all the shop locations and a couple of discount coupons. Some of these have expired since we really do cater to the lake crowd during the summer, but there are still plenty of good deals. I handed her the cup of coffee, like this free salted caramel coffee blend just for you and me. I picked up the other cup I made for myself, and we clinked our mugs together. Bev, she finally smiled at me. My name is Bev. Roxanne Bloom, but my friends call me Roxy. I smiled back and looked over her shoulder as Louise came back through the door with Norman's packet of papers under her arm. 
Do you want to adopt Norman? Louise saddled right up to Jimmer. I want to, but Mimi said no. We've got Papa. Jimmer was as serious as a heart attack. Louise looked over at Bev, and they both started to laugh. I understand that, Louise joked back, though she wasn't married. I hope I don't understand. I held up my finger with my engagement ring. I've got an appointment with the wedding planner this afternoon. Marriage is all good. Bev had relaxed a little since she walked in here. I wasn't prepared for the stepchild. Everything that goes wrong is blamed on me, and I am sick and tired of it. I'm going to tell his daughter that, too, when I see her tomorrow. She's coming into town? I questioned, tossing the used filters as I cleaned the commercial coffee pots. Grabbing the big jar of my own harvest blend, I counted out the scoops needed to make the perfect brew. Yes, all members of the board are coming here. I don't know why he gave her a job when she wasn't doing anything at her previous employer. But it's the I wasn't a good enough father syndrome Ron is trying to make up for. She sighed and took another drink of her coffee. There's such a syndrome? Louise had made herself a cup of tea from the tea bar. I watched her pour from the bee honey farm pots into the steaming cup. No, Bev cackled. That's what I call his actions towards his daughter. She was addicted to painkillers. She's in her late thirties, thrice divorced, can't hold a job, and is barely a mother. I looked around to see where Jimmer had gone, because I didn't want him to hear what Bev was saying about his mother. She was still his mother. He had walked over to the tree and was looking at the fall ornaments. Pepper was standing between his legs, just begging for some attention. That's a shame. Louise was buying into this woman's story. I listened to the two of them while I finished making the regular coffee and a pot of decaffeinated, which was a sin. Whoever drank decaf should be shot, in my opinion. Just saying. I excused myself through the kitchen door to retrieve the three carafes of coffee I needed to brew. School would be letting out for the day, and that was when Kami picked up the last hospitality coffee for the day for her guests. Laughter filtered through the door, and I knew Louise and Bev were still talking about Bev's situation. I was really sad for Jimmer, especially if he was in an environment where Bev didn't want to keep him for the summer and his grandfather was always working. The afternoon was getting away from me, so instead of baking something new, I decided to get Snickerdoodle mini cheesecakes out of the freezer, along with some red velvet chocolate chip cookies. These were items I baked ahead of time and froze to serve later. Setting them out now would give them the perfect amount of time to thaw. The white single platter with the thick stand was perfect for displaying the red velvets. A domed lid I'd picked up from Wild and Whimsy was a perfect fit. I stacked a few more on there, then went back into the coffee house, placing the stand on the counter at the corner of the L shape. It was a perfect place to let them sit and thaw as the warmth of the fire glowed from the fireplace. We do love it here. I'm sure you will, too. Louise touched Bev's arm and got up from the stool she'd pulled over. Look at there. She pointed to one of the couches in front of the fireplace. Jimmer had nestled his back up against the couch and had Norman snuggled up next to him. Jimmer slowly rubbed his hand down the pug as he stared into the fire. Norman's little eyes were closed, and the loudest snoring I'd ever heard came out of him. Big sounds come from that little dog. I shook my head and prayed his cuteness would get him a forever home. I walked over to the fall tree and rearranged some of the ornaments as I like to do each day. I like to rotate the pumpkins, leaves, acorns, pine cones, and coffee-themed ornaments so they each got equal time on the front of the tree to be seen by the customers. The orange lights glowed, adding a warm touch to the seasonal display. I didn't mean to come in here and take up your time. Bev pushed the coffee mug away from her. I wanted to come in and apologize for Ron's behavior. I keep telling him that if he does buy the land on the bee farm and open the resort, that I'm the one who will be involved in the community like every other time he's opened a new resort and moved me there for a few years. Resort? I stuck the pine cone back on the tree without worrying about its placement. I hurried over. Was Kami right? I've said too much. Jimmer, Mimi says it's time to go. She referred to herself in the third person. What resort? I wasn't about to let her leave without getting at least one detail. My husband has a company that buys uninhabited land all over the world. 
for the last five years he's been looking for the right sleepy little town for resort and golf course the bee farm is perfect there was sheer delight on her face i didn't know the bee farm was for sale louise's brows knitted together honey anything is for sale for the right price bev waved jimmer over thank you for the fancy coffee roxy it was delicious roxanne my name is roxanne i muttered under my breath as bev and jimmer walked out of the coffee house four during the school year a few seniors from honey springs high school worked the last couple of hours of the day at the bean hive the economics teacher had asked me to speak to the class about how i started my business and while i was there i'd met the home economics teacher who then asked me to come speak to her class about how i made the coffee and baked goods it was a pleasant surprise to see how eager the students were to learn how to run a small business as well as learn to bake one of the seniors interested in baking was kelly spark brother mitchell spark's daughter brother spark was the preacher at honey springs baptist church kelly had a twin christine who didn't like coffee yeah i rolled my eyes when she told me she didn't like coffee but kelly now she was a different story she jumped at the chance to work at the bean hive she worked the afternoon shift and was always on time usually early in fact kelly had replaced emily rich a young woman who'd worked for me during her senior year of high school and had recently opened the bee's knees bakery in honey springs we are making bunt cakes next week kelly threw her backpack behind the counter and picked up pepper giving him smooches she had long red hair that hung down her back today she had it braided in low pigtails and wore a pair of blue jean overalls with white converse tennis shoes her blue eyes sparkled i'm so excited for any suggestions you might have hmm i untied my apron and exchanged it for my jacket i think i have a great recipe for the drizzling icing at home let me check and i'll get back to you while i gathered everything i needed to take home kelly scanned down the bakery counter for that after school treat she filled a big glass with milk and settled for a snickerdoodle mini cheesecake she pulled up on her tiptoes and looked over the counter when she heard a few grunts oh my gosh is that the new pet palace animal she squealed as she put down her sweet treat and ran around the corner i've been trying to get my dad to let us have a dog can you imagine a dog in church be careful i warned i'd come to realize that every time norman grunted he expelled gas it would for sure keep the congregation awake i joked because some of the members of honey springs baptist church took the hour to keep their eyes closed i'm not saying they weren't listening but when eyes are closed and mouths are gaped open it'd be a safe bet they were napping I swear Kelly's pigtail stood on end after she bent down to rub on him and quickly stumbled backwards. Is that coming from him? It sure isn't from any of my food or coffee. I started to laugh. Yeah, he's got some gastrointestinal issues that you have to disclose to people who might be interested. I patted the packet next to the cash register where Louise had left his paperwork. His name is Norman. Kelly took a step forward and braved the stink to pet him some more. Everything is stocked. Just make sure you turn out the lights and lock the door. I always reminded her to lock the door. Not that Honey Springs was crime-ridden, but an unlocked door called for uninvited guests. I'm going to be late for my wedding planning appointment if we don't get out of here. Go. I've got this, Kelly said and walked back behind the counter to wash her hands. I'd love for Pepper to keep me and Norman company since it looks like you've already cleaned and restocked. Are you sure? I grabbed 3 to go cups. I wanted to take Patrick and Babette a treat. And salted caramel coffee and pumpkin and chocolate chip scones were a perfect combination. I put caramel in the bottom of the cups along with a little salt before I filled them to the brim with coffee. He can go with me. No, I'm fine. Go before Patrick comes down and drags you out of here. She was joking, but he was always complaining that I spent all my time in the coffee house. Okay, I ho hummed and grabbed a couple of scones before I stopped shy of the door. And your dad is all on board for the festival? Totally. She grinned about our little scheme and gave me the okay sign with her fingers. The jacket I was wearing was almost too light for the current cool weather we were having. 
The weather forecast was calling for a few unseasonably cold weeks, but that was fine by me because it made it feel like the holidays, and this was my favorite time of the year. All the signs literally pointed to how amazing Honey Springs was this time of year. Small banners hung from the tall lamp posts every ten feet on the boardwalk, along with colorful hanging baskets of flowers that I was sure Jean Hill had donated. The trees along the lake had the burnt orange setting sun behind them, casting a shadow into the lake. All about the details was two shops down from the coffee house. It was a cute blue clabbered house with two stories that had been completely gutted and transformed with an open concept floor plan. The boardwalk had had a facelift about a year ago, the same time I'd opened the beehive, and they were able to keep the cute exterior of the building with a remodeled and updated inside. You'd never know it looking at the outside. When you walked through the double doors, they opened into an entryway decorated with seasonal items. This time of the year, Babette filled it with fall garland, pumpkins, and bales of hay with a lot of scarecrows. A hallway led down to the back of the building and a large ballroom addition with round tables covered in white linens and ten chairs around each. It was a perfect place to host a wedding reception during the winter months or the heat of the summer since most weddings in Honey Springs took place outside. I was getting worried. Patrick Kane's big brown eyes searched my face as he heaved big breaths in and out like he was looking for validation that I was going to marry him. Patrick, I handed him the coffees. I'm not going to be a runaway bride. I know you're gun shy about it, and I just want to make sure before we go in there with Babette and your mom and Maxie, he started to say. What? I nearly dropped the bags with the scones. Why are they here? I looked over his shoulder, searching for them. Just hear me out. He put his hand out in front of me like to shush me. Your mom wasn't at your first wedding which is why she says there was bad juju from the beginning, and Maxie doesn't want Penny to one-up her. His eyes softened, as did his chiseled jaw, as a tender smile crossed his lips. If you just let them sit in on our first session with Babette and give them some sort of easy job, I'm sure they'll be out of your hair. Our hair. I'm sure you're all sorts of wrong. I waved my free hand around in the air. We are talking about Penny and Maxine Bloom. When have they ever kept their noses out of anyone's business, especially mine? There you are! Penny Bloom, my mother, took off in a dead sprint towards us as she emerged from the hallway, nearly knocking over Aunt Maxie. Penny, I've done warned you! Aunt Maxie's face looked like she'd been weaned on a pickle. I gave birth to her and I'm the mother of the bride, so listen here. Penny jerked around, putting her hands on her hips, and flicked a brow. Ladies, this is my bride, and we were gracious enough to let you come today. Babette emerged from the hallway with a stack of magazines and a pen stuck in her messy blonde topknot. I only care about Roxy and Patrick right now, so if you two can't get along, then I guess you're going to have to find yourselves out that door. Babette didn't give them no time to fuss back at her, nor did she bother to stop and look at them. She trotted on past the feuding pair and headed over to the couches, where she put a stack of magazines on the coffee table. Roxy, you come sit right here. She patted one side of the couch. And Patrick, you come sit right here. She patted the opposite side of the couch. She gave one good stern pointed finger to Penny and Maxie. You go sit on that stool, and you sit on that one. But those are so far away, and I've got bad hearing, Aunt Maxie protested. And I'm the mother of the bride, Penny stomped. And that's the door. Babette took a seat between me and Patrick. I didn't know we were going to have company, or I'd brought them a coffee, too. I felt bad. Even though Mom and Aunt Maxie wore me out, I still loved them and never wanted to leave anyone out when it came to coffee. That'd be a sin. They don't need it. Babette reached for one of the coffees. There were some grunts and groans coming from Mom and Aunt Maxie in disapproval of them not getting coffee. When I went to look at them, Babette snapped her fingers to bring me back to her. I've been working with Honeycomb Salon to get you on the schedule for a few hair appointments. 
She took a spiral notebook off the top pile of magazines and flipped it open. There was a big photo of me and Patrick from the Honey Springs Tribune from the article Aunt Maxie had put in about the wedding of Honey Springs' lifetime. Yeah, she did that. She went so far as to say in the article how everyone in Honey Springs was invited and you didn't want to miss this grandiose affair. We'd not even picked a date, much less decided anything else about the wedding. This is your wedding planner, she proudly patted the page. Here's some suggested wedding dresses. She flipped the page. I think you should get the first one, Mom spouted out. That's the one we can agree on. Aunt Maxie dug in her purse and pulled out a big can of hairspray. She fluffed her hair up so high, I swear it had its own zip code. You're going to look prettier than a store-bought doll, she nodded with pinched lips. I gulped and looked at the dress again. I'm not sure if I want to wear big puffy sleeves and a big bell around my waist. I was thinking more along the lines of a simple dress that I can get over at the boutique. Nothing real fancy. My words were met with gasps from all three women. Y'all, I've had the fancy wedding. But Patrick hasn't. Mom jumped off her stool. She ignored Babette's warning to stay put. He's waited all these years to marry you when I know he could have had any woman in Honey Springs, available or not. I think we can skip this part of the planning process and let Roxy think about it. Patrick got up from his side of the couch and sat down next to me. Here are the things we do know. He squeezed my shoulder. Emily Rich will be making my cake. I want the wedding to be simple and in front of the cocoon inn. I only want a few family and friends. I shot Aunt Maxie a look when she opened her mouth to say something, but clapped it shut when our eyes met. I'm going to pick out my dress. I turned to Babette. All I need you to do is to set me up with a hair appointment with Chrissy Lane. Oh, dear, Aunt Maxie groaned. Her hair is going to look like it was chucked right out on the side of a lawnmower. Aunt Maxie wasn't a big fan of Chrissy Lane's ability to do hair. I knew Chrissy would do exactly what I asked her to do and was fine with using her. Well, we'll just have to put extra lipstick on Roxy, Mom assured, making Aunt Maxie happy, since Aunt Maxie always thought you could never wear too much lipstick. That's it. I put my hands on my legs and pushed to stand up. I'd had enough planning for one evening, and really, my mind wasn't on it. That's it? Patrick looked up at me. I thought we were going to set a date. We will, I held out my hand. Me and you. I looked at Babette. I'll get back to you. I've got to run anyways. Mom brushed her hands down her sweater. I've got an important client to meet with, and I'd like to get there early to prepare. My mom had never been a fan of Honey Springs when I was growing up, before my father died. He'd bring me here for summers because he had loved it here as a boy. Plus, he loved visiting Aunt Maxie, who was his great aunt. I gave Mom, Aunt Maxie, and Babette a hug. Patrick was holding the door for me. How about some supper? He ran his hand down my back. I'll grab some takeout from the watershed. That sounds amazing. The watershed was a floating restaurant on the lake located on the left side of the far end of the boardwalk. They also hosted romantic dinner cruises. Patrick and I had yet to go on one, but we would eventually. You want to grab Pepper and your bike and wait for me at the truck? He suggested. Actually, I'm going to enjoy this nice evening and ride us back to the cabin. I looked up at the darkening sky and noticed the blanket of stars. It was going to be a gorgeous night, and I wanted to take every opportunity to be wrapped up in it. I will meet you and Sassy at my place. Sassy was Patrick's black standard poodle, who had also been adopted from the pet palace. Great, she's at my office, so I'll be right there. He lowered his chin, meeting his lips with mine, sending a wave of flutters straight to my heart. This was exactly what I needed to end my day. We walked down the boardwalk, hand in hand and love between us. We didn't have to speak. It was something that we'd been comfortable with since the first time I'd met him, after my father had dropped me off for the summer. Patrick and I were teens. He'd worked for his father's construction company, Kane Construction. He'd actually come to do some work on Aunt Maxie's house. My heart still flipped over him like it did the first time I saw him. 
We spent every waking moment together that summer and every summer after. Aunt Maxie lost her house in a recession, and he bought it from her. At the time, I was too young and stupid to understand that he was helping her. I felt like he was taking her house from her, when in reality, he was keeping her from going bankrupt. That's when I tried to put Patrick Kane out of my head. I hunkered down to go to college and law school, and then met and married a fellow law student, Kirk, only to open a law firm with Kirk and find him doing more with a client than offering legal advice. That's when I realized I wasn't in love with him, quit being a lawyer, and found myself in my Aunt Maxie's arms here in Honey Springs, where I'd always found comfort. I'll see you soon. I let go of his hand when we made it to the beanhive. I stood at the entrance and watched him walk down the boardwalk, remembering the first time I'd seen him after I'd moved back. He was in charge of cane construction and doing all the boardwalk renovations. I'd felt sorry for the crew since they were as early as I was and took them some coffee. We'd grown up into adults, and though I recognized his eyes, I couldn't place them. When he came to the shop to do some repair work for my landlord, Aunt Maxie, it was then that I realized who he was. Leave it to Aunt Maxie to know exactly who and what I needed because she set the entire thing up. It took a few days, but Patrick did get me to listen to his side of the story and how wrong I was about Aunt Maxie's house. I knew that he loved me so much, even though I was off doing my own thing. He had saved my beloved Aunt Maxie. "'You okay?' Kelly asked when I finally opened the door. She just dropped off a cup of coffee and some leftover ham and bean soup to a couple on the couch. "'You weren't gone long.' "'I'm fine.' I looked around. "'You've had some customers.' Yeah, I can't believe how many tourists are here this year for the Niwala Festival. It's been hopping. She did a drive-by wipe down of a table and grabbed an empty cup a customer had left. That was one thing I loved about Kelly. She saw what needed to be done and got it done quickly. I'm here to grab Pepper and meet Patrick back at my house. I looked over at Norman's kennel. Pepper was lying next to it. How long has Norman been in his cage? I asked. He went in there shortly after you left, she said, and headed over to the cash register with money in hand. Norman, I said and bent down to the cage. Are you okay? I questioned him. He lifted his head and grunted. Are you okay with taking him for a walk before you close? I asked, making sure he would be okay for the night. Of course. She hit the buttons on the register and got out some change. I'll get them all tucked in. She walked the change over to the customers on the couch. I reached into the cage and gave Norman one last pat on the head before grabbing Pepper's little sweater and leash off the hook. Pepper jumped around in excitement. He was so smart. He knew when I got his sweater and leash, it was time to go home. But when I got only his leash, he knew we were going for a quick walk. I grabbed Pepper's little blanket from underneath the counter. Remember to come straight to the lake tomorrow for work since I'm closing the shop for the festival, reminding Kelly I'd have a booth down on the beach in front of the Cocoon Inn during the festivities. I can't wait. I'm dressing up too, she said with excitement, and I'm not going to tell you what I'm dressing up as either. Then I'm not telling you either. I winked and said goodbye. Pepper darted out of the door and stopped shy of the length of the leash because he knew it'd jerk him back. We walked over to the bike rack and I unchained my bike. Bicycles were the main mode of transportation in and around Honey Springs. Of course we had cars. I had one. But it was much easier to bike the seven minutes to my cabin in one direction or the seven minutes in the opposite direction to downtown Honey Springs. If I needed more produce than I could comfortably carry on my bike, I'd take the car out to the hill orchard. If I needed to run a lot of errands, I'd take the car, but for general, everyday use, while the weather allowed, I rode my bike everywhere. Besides, Pepper looked so cute, all snuggled up in his blanket in the basket between the handlebars. The wood planks thumped underneath my tires as we drove down the boardwalk to the right. Off in the distance, I could see the small white twinkling lights along the beach, connecting a few white tents. The tents were for vendors and games for the tourists. It seemed like this year the event was going to be bigger than ever. 
I knew that Kami was excited because she'd spent money on a small addition to accommodate more guests at the inn. The festivals were great publicity for Honey Springs, showing how we catered to our tourists in all seasons. The weather person had been right. The cool air whipped around me, creating goosebumps all over my body. I zipped the coat up to my neck as we coasted down the ramp of the boardwalk and onto the road leading straight to the cabin. Though it was still early in the evening, the moon had already taken its place in the dark sky and gave off some light through the trees as they covered the road like a bridge. Soon the leaves would be falling, leaving the trees naked for the winter months. My mind was all in a tizzy about Bev's husband wanting to build a resort on the Bee Farms Island. My stomach churned at the thought of it. Ron didn't care about our town. Bev wasn't even part of the family she married into, never mind wanting to be part of the Honey Springs family. Pepper hunkered down a little more in the basket as the wind whipped around us at every turn. I'm sorry. I realized I was probably pedaling too fast and creating even more cold air for my sweet baby. I have so much on my mind with the possibility of this new resort coming in. Pepper looked up at me with his big, black, puppy dog eyes from underneath his salt and pepper eyebrows. I swear he was the best listener. I'm just not so sure that Honey Springs needs a golf course and all that fancy stuff. We are perfectly content with our little town. I took the last curve before my cabin and looked to my left over the lake. The moonshine made it appear as if there was a layer of glass over the still lake. I couldn't help but think that the lake would constantly be moving if we had a large resort where boaters would be up at all hours of the night. There was a no-wake zone in front of the boardwalk, but not on my portion of the quiet, untouched lake. We pulled into my driveway and up to the small log cabin that I called home. I still wasn't sure about moving me and Pepper into Patrick's house. It was a large house on the opposite side of Honey Springs. Though I had loved that house since I stayed there with Aunt Maxie all those summers, this cabin had given me comfort and brought me back to love when I had needed it most in my life. It had healed me when I was broken. I got off the bike and lifted Pepper out of his basket. He ran around and did his business while I walked the bike over to the front porch steps, leaning it on the kickstand. I walked up the stairs and opened the door, flipping the porch light to welcome Patrick when he got there. On my way to the front door, I fluffed up the outdoor pillows on the two rocking chairs my grandfather had made and were perfect for the small porch. The deep brown, ladder-back-style rockers were so comfortable. I left the door open behind me so Pepper could come in. The inside of the cabin was very cozy. To the left was a small family room with a wood-burning stove and two couches arranged in an L-shape with big fluffy pillows to fall into. The kitchen was to the right with open shelving and a small table for two. The bathroom and laundry room were located in the back of the cabin on the right. The natural light from the skylights showcased the set of stairs that led up to my bedroom. I flipped on all the lights as I made my way up the steps to change my clothes. Even though I smelled like I worked in a gingerbread factory, I still wanted the comfort of a pair of sweats and an old sweatshirt. The white iron bed, which Aunt Maxie let me take from her storage unit with the patchwork quilt as a comforter, screamed for me to lay down just for a minute. Roxy? I heard Patrick call my name. I jumped up and realized that the couple of minutes I'd laid down for had turned into ten. I'm coming down, just changing my clothes, I called back, quickly grabbing some sweats from my dresser. He'd already stoked the fire and gotten the chill out from the day. There were two glasses of wine, our plated food, and two lit candles on the small table. You seem distracted. He handed me a glass of wine before he walked over to the front door, opening it for Sassy and Pepper to come in. Want to talk about it? Do you know anything about a resort interested in coming to the bee farm? I asked and took a sip of wine. There's been some rumblings about it. His head bobbed side to side. I'm conflicted. It's a great opportunity for cane construction to bid on, but I'm not so sure it's good for the bee farm. How could it be good for the bee farm? I questioned. If there's no room for the bees to pollinate, the bee population will go down, and I'm sure that's not good at all. Honey Springs is based on the bees. All of our shops, our entire economy. Where will I get my honey? Roxy, Patrick said with an amused look on his face as he looked over the table at me. The candles cast a warm glow on his face. 
I had no idea you were so passionate about the bees. I picked up my fork and twirled some spaghetti around it a few times. I'd suddenly lost my appetite when he confirmed he'd heard about the resort. Is this something you might be interested in bidding for? I didn't look at him, for fear I'd see confirmation in his eyes that he had indeed thought about it. The owner called and left a message with Debbie. Patrick was referring to his sister, Debbie Kane. Debbie had recently started working for the family's company, something she was reluctant to do because she didn't want people thinking she was given a handout after her husband, Tim, had died. She was a single stay-at-home mom and really did try to get another job, but with an unreliable sitter, her son, Timmy Jr., was always being shuffled around to different people, including me. After a few weeks of this, Debbie had given in and taken the great job Patrick had waiting for her. It amazed me that Patrick didn't seem to be phased by the idea of a resort at the bee farm. He continued to eat until he looked up and noticed I wasn't eating. Roxy, I'm not saying I'm happy with the bees dying out or whatever is going on over on the island, but we can't stop economic development. It's part of life, and if it's going to help us grow our community... He set his fork down and shrugged one shoulder. I think he's just digging around. Ask your mom. She had that meeting with him tonight. That's who she was meeting with? I dropped my fork. She's on the bandwagon of having a resort come here and kill even more bees? I couldn't believe it. I don't think he's been to... Ron. His name is Ron. I wanted to make sure Patrick knew his name. Okay. Patrick picked his fork back up and leaned his forearms on the table. Ron isn't trying to be quiet about it. From what I heard, he's bringing in the CFO, secretary, and other members of his company's board to come to the festival and check out the town. Apparently, he likes the small town thing. He doesn't like being with family. I couldn't understand why Honey Springs was so appealing to someone like Ron. At least from what Bev had said about him. His wife, Bev, said that Ron was never with his daughter when she was growing up. In fact, I tapped the edge of the fork on my plate. She said that they'd just rekindled their relationship and he offered to take care of his grandson for the summer. See, he's trying to be a good family man. Patrick took a bite of his food. No, he's not. Bev said when he took the grandson for the summer, it meant that she was supposed to take care of him while he went off looking for uninhabited land to build his grand resorts on. They only live in these areas for a couple of years before he moves on to the next business deal. I got up and took my plate over to the counter, where I dumped the contents into a plastic container for later. She said all that? Patrick finished up the last of his food and gulped down the rest of his wine. That and more. I wasn't sure what all she'd said to Bunny, but I knew it was an earful and I'd check on that in the morning. For now, I put my plate in the dishwasher and then cleaned up Patrick's. It's been a long day. Tomorrow's going to be longer. Patrick walked up behind me and wrapped his arms around me. Can we make a decision on the wedding date before we watch Netflix? I twisted around in his arms to face him and draped my arms over his shoulders. Do you really want a fancy wedding? I did want him to tell me the truth. This is your first and only wedding, so I want you to have what you want. I want you to be my wife. That's all. He kissed the tip of my nose. If you want a big wedding, then I'll do it. If you don't, that's fine, too. Let me get through Nuala Festival, and I'll give you a definite date. My words pleased him because he smiled so big. I'm going to become Mrs. Patrick Kane. That's music to my ears. He gave me a good squeeze. Now, are you going to move them or make me the bad guy? We looked over at Sassy and Pepper. They were sprawled out over the couch in front of the TV, basking in the warmth and glow of the fireplace. You can be the bad guy. I nudged him their way and grabbed my wine glass. I took a couple of sips and couldn't stop smiling. Patrick was perfect for me. He knew how to calm me when I was all uptight about Ron building some grand resort. Patrick didn't seem too bothered by it, and he'd lived here all his life. I tried to bottle up his reassurance, but the goosebumps crawling up my legs and along my body were not from being chilled. 5. When I opened the door to the bean hive the next morning, I was fully prepared to have the smell of pumpkin spice fill my spirit with joy. Instead, 
Norman was standing there, filling the bakery with his own joy. Good morning, Norman. I greeted the white pudgy pup with a pat on the head and a quick rub on the belly. We've got a few hours to get this stink on out of here. But before we do anything, I called over my shoulder, hanging my bag on the coat rack and grabbing an extra leash I had hanging there after I flipped all the coffee pots on the brew cycle. We are going to go potty. Norman grunted and snorted his way to the door, which was a good sign that he was potty trained. I glanced over at the pee pads I had Kelly lay out, and they were dry. This was a good thing to tell any potential forever homes. I'd gotten up at 4 a.m., about a half hour earlier than normal. I'd had a nightmare that included a bulldozer digging up the bee farm and hordes of bees flying across the lake, buzzing into the bean hive. Pepper, Sassy, and Patrick were all snuggled up together when I woke up. I didn't have the heart to wake up Pepper and bring him with me. Plus, Patrick would bring him by, and any time I got to see Patrick was a big win. Norman wasn't the fastest dog in the world, and the frosty air didn't seem to get him to go any faster. Though I wanted to get back to the coffee house and get the donuts, scones, and muffins in the oven to get Norman's ungodly smell out of the shop, I couldn't help but take time to gaze over at the bee farm. I zipped my jacket up as far as it would go and put my free hand in my pocket. The moon hung overhead, shedding some light on the mostly forested island. I couldn't even picture looking across the lake at a big resort that was all lit up all the time. When there were a lot of lights, it was hard to see the stars. That was one of the things I loved about a small town compared to a large city. The lights of a city dimmed the effect of a starry night, and a big resort would have the same effect. I'm sorry, Norman. I'd been so wrapped up in my thoughts, I didn't realize Norman had done his business and was tugging me back towards the boardwalk. Are you ready to eat? He got a little more giddy up in his step. Do you want to eat? I asked again to see if he did understand. His little legs moved faster and faster towards the bean hive. You do know what I'm saying. Good boy, Norman. The bean hive was the only shop on the boardwalk that opened at 6 a.m., even Emily Rich at the Bee's Knees Bakery didn't open until 10 a.m. Today was going to be a different day than most. I was going to be open until noon. At noon, I'd move everything to the tent I'd rented for the Niwala Festival. Babette had rented me a few glass counters, and Patrick had run me some electric from the Cocoon Inn so I could keep the coffee and tea bar going. I'd written a note for Kelly to get out of school early and have it count towards her final in economics class. She had to write a paper about how the festival would help with the economy in Honey Springs. Here you go. I filled Norman's bowl with some of the prescription kibble Louise had left and freshened up his water. I'll flip on the coffee pots because that will help with the unwanted smell. I didn't want to offend him. I lit the candles on the fireplace mantel. I put a starter log in the fireplace and tented up some of the kindling so it would catch fire. Between the fireplace and the candles, I prayed Norman's stinky toots would go unnoticed. I left him in the coffee house to eat while I headed into the kitchen. I grabbed my apron from the hook when I pushed through the door, tying it around my waist and then turning on the ovens. I headed into the freezer to get this morning's pastries. The mini all-butter bunt cakes with drizzles of pumpkin spice frosting were a perfect treat for the cool morning, along with cranberry orange glazed scones. I also grabbed bags of frozen cake donuts and blueberry muffins. They were always big sellers. The ovens had to be preheated before I could bake, so I set the frozen pastries on the island and turned back to the dry ingredient shelves. I needed the ingredients for the Halloween pumpkin oatmeal dog treats that I told Louise I'd give her for the adoption packets she was handing out at the festival. The pumpkin-shaped cookie cutter was keeping with the spirit of the festivities. Although our furry friends wouldn't know it was a pumpkin, their people would. It was a small touch that I hoped everyone would notice, including Bev and Ron, in hopes they'd realize you just couldn't plop a big resort down just in any small town. Canned pumpkin, I whispered to myself and dragged my finger down the cans on one of the dry ingredient shelves. Oatmeal, whole wheat flour. I piled the jars in my arms and grabbed the olive oil in one hand and the cinnamon in the other. The ovens dinged to tell me they were preheated. I emptied my arms on the island and grabbed a few bacon sheets. I lined them with parchment paper and placed all the frozen goodies on them. Before I put a few of the baking sheets in the ovens, I turned on the timer. 
The kitchen door swayed back and forth a little bit. Norman was starting to get comfortable and curious. This was a good sign. I smiled when the door nudged open a little more the next time. Then finally, it opened just enough for his portly body to come through. After a few grunts and sniffs, he looked over at me. His little tail wagged a quick few times before he decided to come to me. I quickly opened the can of pumpkin and swiped my fingertip in it, giving Norman a taste. Pumpkin will be good for your issues, I told him like I didn't want to offend him with any impolite words, like farts. Now that you're here, what do you think about the possibilities of a resort? I asked Norman and grabbed a mixing bowl along with a set of measuring cups. Patrick doesn't seem to think it's truly going to go anywhere, but if Ron is having all his people come here, whatever that means... I waved the whisk at Norman. He grunted and went after the drop of pumpkin that had fallen off the utensil. People! Who on earth has people? Norman stood next to me, looking around my feet for any more little morsels that might have dropped to the ground. I might have helped a few times. I was making all-natural treats, and I couldn't wait for him to try them. The buttery smell of the pastries mixed with a hint of blueberry and other fall ingredients that were in the oven, began to dance in the air and fill the space. I took in a deep inhale while Norman grunted when he lay down. His little bit of joy made me forget about Ron and his big, ridiculous ideas as I kneaded the ingredients together to form the dough for the dog treats. There was a loud knock at the front door of the coffee house. I glanced at the timer on the oven to make sure it wasn't about to go off before I pushed through the door. Kami, I said, and picked up the edges of my apron to clean my hands before I opened the door to let her in. What on earth are you doing out here at this time? I couldn't sleep. I went for a walk down on the beach and noticed your light was already on. She had the tired eyes of a middle-aged woman that I'd never seen on her face before. I'll just take the hospitality items back with me to save you a trip. I was just making some treats for the pet palace booth. Grab a cup of coffee and come on back. I nodded my head towards the kitchen for her to follow me. You're just in time for some goodies right out of the oven. I called over my shoulder and passed through the kitchen door. I knew if I kept it light and did not ask what was wrong right away, the coffee time would do its magic and open her up without me having to probe. Lightly, I threw flour on the surface of the work island and began to roll out the dough. Who is this little feller? Kami blew over the top of the mug. The steam curled up around her nose. That's Norman. Did you smell anything unusual while you were out there? I asked. Just the delicious smells coming from in here. She looked over at the oven when the timer dinged. Do you want me to get that? Sure. I held up my hands that were covered in the oatmeal pumpkin dough. You can take some of these to Felix. Felix was the cat Walker had adopted for Amelia. He was a very shy cat and hid from everyone that came into the shop. I had been so worried Felix wasn't going to find his forever home. Every time Walker came into the coffee house, Felix started to his side. It was a perfect match. I guess it was true that a cat picked its owner and not the other way around. As I flowered the pumpkin cookie cutter... I watched Kami grab the pot holders and take out the baking sheets out of the corner of my eye. You can put them on the cooling racks. There was a tall steel shelf next to the ovens. I thought Amelia was going to stop by yesterday after school to take Pepper for a walk. I told her that she'd see him all night at the festival. I have so much on my mind that I can't even think straight. She shut the oven door. Do you want me to turn the oven off? No, I've got to bake these treats and Bunny should be here soon. We'll need to put more people treats in. I looked at the four baking sheets to try to calculate just how much more I was going to need to bake for the short time we were open today. I've got all the items for the festival all ready to go, and Kelly will be taking off school at noon to help warm them and bring them down to the tent. Those are so cute. She peeked over at the baking sheet where I'd started to put the dog treats. I swear I can't imagine what Honey Springs would be like if you hadn't moved here. I noticed she'd had some of the talking serum I call coffee. It was perfect for what I needed in my life. Honey Springs was a hug to my soul. You mean the small town and the community to go with it? She took another drink. Because that couple I pointed out to you when you were leaving yesterday, they want to build a big resort on the bee farm. I heard. My lips dipped into a frown, as did my brows. 
I can't imagine looking over there and seeing a bunch of lights on all day and night. It wouldn't be so bad if they weren't so rude. She took a deep breath and let it out through her nose like a bull. Ron came into the cocoon inn and ripped it apart. At first I thought he was just a guest, and then he started to tell me how his big resorts catered to each individual guest. They didn't have just a couple of choices on their menu like we do, and how he had a famous chef at each of his resorts. Then he proceeded to tell me about the linens on the beds, and how they were bamboo compared to my cotton ones. She looked at me over the top of her mug. Apparently, bamboo lets the body breathe at night, allowing for a more restful sleep. That man, she spat. I'm sorry. I wish I could say Ron wasn't serious, but Patrick mentioned he'd called and talked to Debbie about setting up a meeting. I filled a few of the baking sheets with the pumpkin dog treats and put them in the oven. Debbie was going to be at the Niwala Festival with Timmy, and I knew I'd see them, so it would be a great opportunity to ask her about the phone call she'd received from Ron. Ron's wife doesn't seem too happy. I turned the timer to 30 minutes. They might need to bake a few minutes more, but I'd rather check them before they got too done. Furry friends were picky when it came to treats. If they were too done, they didn't want to eat them. A little hard on the outside with a bit of mush on the inside seemed to be their perfect combination. Their grandson is so mean to them. I overheard him tell Ron he was mean, and he knew why his mom had kept him away from them for so long. Walker would never let Amelia talk that way to us. She tipped the mug, getting out every single drop. Amelia has been and is being raised properly, I reminded her. When I see and hear children that come into the coffee house and act spoiled, I know it's how they are raised. I need more coffee, do you? She looked in my empty mug. I needed a refill a long time ago. I winked and rolled out more dog treat dough. Bev did mention how they didn't have a great relationship with Ron's daughter. I continued to cut out cookies while she went back into the coffee house to refill our drinks. She said that in front of Ron? She seems so timid when he's around. She put my cup on the counter in front of me. She gets all tight-lipped. Really? I didn't get that impression of her at all. I thought back to how snotty she acted. She came back in with Jimmer without Ron. I guess it was when Ron was making all of his phone calls. I ran my hand down my apron and pulled my phone out of my back pocket. Which reminds me, Patrick said Ron had made an appointment with my mom to see the property. I want to call her about it, but it's too early. So you're bothered by it too? Kami looked up at me. I don't think we need a big resort, I shrugged. You've got the bed and breakfast in town, and you're in. Plus, we have all the rental cabins around the lake. There's no need for a big resort. I agree, but Ron continues to make little nasty comments about the inn, like it smells musty. Do you think it smells musty? She bit the edge of her lip. No. I'm hoping to find out more when I talk to my mom. I filled up three more baking sheets, confident these would be enough to start Louise off with. Kelly was going to make more for me this afternoon. We'd have plenty for the festival. Penny is pretty confidential about her clients, Cammie noted. She was right. Mom didn't like to talk about potential sales because she said it put bad things out into the universe. I've got something that'll make her talk. I wiggled my ring finger in the air. A wedding. You are so evil, Roxy Bloom, and I love it. Cammie's nose curled and she wrapped her hands around her mug, bringing it up to her lips. I wish the fairy would capsize and he'd drown. Not your mom, of course. She threw that in. Be sure to make some chocolate treats for the festival. I can't get enough. She looked at her watch. Got somewhere to be? I asked. Walker is going to get his mom from Glad Tidings Nursing Home so she can enjoy the festival. She took a few more drinks of her coffee. I know he loves her so much, but she doesn't know him, and the dementia has progressed to where she's got to be in a wheelchair. Walker's mom had gotten the first signs of dementia over 30 years ago when he was just about ready to graduate from high school. She'd been in Glad Tidings Nursing Home ever since. He knows that she's getting worse, and he said he doesn't care that she doesn't recognize him. 
He wants Amelia to know her great-grandmother and how family takes care of family. She stood up and tapped the edge of the counter with her hand. At least he's loyal and you are lucky. I took her a cup and put it in a plastic holder to go into the commercial dishwasher when it was full. Are you going to be okay with having all of Ron's staff here? I had a meeting with my staff and told them to put in 100% or else. I have to show this group how amazing my inn is and that they won't be able to compete with it with some big shot resort. Her response was crisp and to a point where it appeared she was on edge. I swear, she said as anger swept across her face. Her jaw tightened. Her eyes snapped. I'd rather drown that man in the lake than let him cross it on a ferry to ruin our town. I'm sure it'll all be good. Have you gone to see Loretta Beebe? I wondered. Kami's brow shot up. She's the president of the beautification committee, and she works with the town council. I'm sure Ron would have to check out the town's requirements for buildings and such a thing. Good idea. Kami went over to the coffee bar where I'd put the commercial coffee carafes and the box of goodies for her hospitality room. She'll be up in my stuff all day with getting the festival all set up and ready to go at 4 p.m. I glanced at the clock. Four will be here quicker than we realize, and I've got a lot to do to get my booth ready, I said and walked her to the door. We said our goodbyes, and I watched her walk down the boardwalk until I couldn't see her anymore. My eyes shifted across the lake to where the sun was popping up over the trees. I tugged my lips together, my brows knitted at the thought of the landscape of such a beautiful sunrise, changing with one single business decision that I hoped the Honey Springs Town Council took under great consideration. It was for the view, after all, that I'd put the long bar across the front of the coffee house so my customers could sit here and relax while enjoying a great cup of coffee. 6. The morning went smoothly. There were a lot more tourists than I'd anticipated, which made me pull out some quiches just in case. Bunny and I had been working so hard that when Patrick came in with Pepper, I didn't get to talk to him. Oh, my stars! Did you hear about the big resort going in at Bee Farm? Maybell Donovan shuffled through the door. You're late today. I glanced up at the clock. Maybell was usually the beehive's first customer of the day. Me and Bunny are going over to see Babette. She picked something up for us today while she was in Lexington. Maybell swept her shawl off her shoulders and plopped down at one of the cafe tables. I'll have one of them caramel thingies. She rolled her finger in the air to the chalkboard with the specials on it. She and Bunny were best friends. They even looked alike. Their hair, house dresses, thick-soled shoes, and shawls. They both always wore some sort of hat or bow on their heads. Today, Maybell had a hat on, which is probably why Bunny had hairpins in her hair. Since we did wear hairnets sometimes, Bunny didn't wear her hat while she was working, but she sure did once she hung that apron up for the day. What was it you were saying about the farm, I asked, and poured all the ingredients in her mug before I poured the coffee over it, giving her an extra dose of whipped cream on top. Bunny was making conversation with a few customers over by the coffee bar where she was restocking the to-go cups, sleeves, stirrers, and a variety of creamers. I heard all sorts of rumblings at the Southern Women's Club and your Aunt Maxie is on it. Maybell and a few of the swanky women in Honey Springs had a special club they made up. Of course, Loretta Beebe was the president of that, too. I wasn't swanky enough to be invited, and that was fine by me, because that meant they paid me to cater their meetings. Making money off of them was A-OK by me. Really? I eased down into the chair across from Maybell after I set her coffee down on the table. Do you think Maxine Bloom is going to let something so big in Hunter Springs go by her big ears? Maybell picked up the coffee mug, pinky sticking out, and took a sip. I mentioned something to her earlier, but she didn't seem so interested. I wondered what had changed her mind. You never knew with Aunt Maxie. She was writing away on that notepad of hers like she was that Diane Sawyer or something. Maybell's nose snarled. You know she's from Kentucky. The bell over the door dinged. 
Maybelle's head was in the way of a full view, but the big pink peacock feather waving in the air clued me in. Speak of Aunt Maxie. I leaned to the right. Aunt Maxie stood right inside the door, looking around. She had on a pink pair of hot pants, pink boots with pink fur along the top, and a pink overcoat, topped off with a pink headband around her forehead with a pink feather stuck in it. Our eyes met and she waved, trotting over. There was a much happier giddy-up in her step compared to yesterday. Maybell, She looked down at Maybell in her way of greeting her. Maybell looked at her blankly. Roxanne, I need to see you. Her brows rose. Alone. In the back. Aunt Maxie didn't bother asking me if I was busy. She simply walked past us. Pepper jumped up from his bed next to Norman's cage. His nails ticked across the floor, rushing behind her. She stopped at the tea bar and picked up one of the jars of honey from the bee farm. She looked at it from all angles before she put it back and headed through the kitchen door with Pepper on her heels. She thinks she is something special with this column she writes, but she's just an old lady like me. Maybell lifted her chin and looked down her nose at me. Aw, oh, I love all y'all. I reached over and patted her hand. I do have to check on some things in the oven. I winked. I gave you a little extra whip. You are a dear, just like your daddy, she smiled. I got up and stopped at Norman's cage before I went to see exactly what Aunt Maxie needed. Hey, Norman. I peeked in and put my hand in when I saw his head pop up. Want to come get a treat? He grunted. I prayed for a stink-free zone and felt confident his special food and my pumpkin treats would get the little feller back on track. There was one thing Norman wasn't. Fast. He took his time following me into the kitchen where we found Aunt Maxie already giving Pepper treats. When Norman saw Pepper eating something, he got a little bit faster. If you are here to get on me about our little meeting with Babette yesterday, you can just walk back out that door. I watched her grab a few more pumpkin-shaped dog treats. I don't care when or how you get married, as long as you don't let that hunk move on to someone else. She snapped the treat in half. Just as long as Penny doesn't have a leg up on me. I stared blankly at her. Mom and Aunt Maxie had really put their differences behind them over the last few months, but she had to stop talking like this. You want something, sweet pea? Aunt Maxie had taken her overcoat off and had flung it on the hook inside the door. The gray sweater underneath wasn't much better, but it did break up her pink outfit. What's your name, baby? That's Norman. Louise gave me a farting dog. I loved how Aunt Maxie cared for animals like me. I hear you're now all over the situation with the bee farm. I guess it's piqued my interest, so I started looking into it. She dragged a stool up to the steel island and threw her big bag on the top. She dug down into it and pulled out a glittery notepad and pen. I took the time to get out some frozen pastries for the festival so they could thaw. As soon as Kelly got here, I was going to start taking things down to the booth. I went over to the bee farm and they wouldn't tell me a thing. Said I'd ruin the deal they needed. The they was Andrew and Kayla Noro, the owners of the bee farm. I have a feeling they don't want to sell. But I noticed you do need some new honey. I mean, look at that bottle out there. All gummed up and sticky. Fine. The bottle was perfectly clean. I wiped them down every day. But I knew I wouldn't win this argument. I can't promise they'll tell me anything. But after Kelly gets here and I set up the booth as much as I can before I take the coffee down there, I'll grab a ferry over and get some new supplies. That's my girl. Aunt Maxie flipped the notepad open. Here's what I know. This Ron has a lot of big resorts named after him. He's got a big ego if you ask me. I gave her a sideways glance because this was a case of the kettle calling the pot black. He's not a big family man. His daughter had a lawsuit against him, but he's got the daughter's son for the summer, and they might have made up, because when I went to the library and looked up his company on the internet, his daughter is now listed as a decorating consultant. You've really done your work. I was a bit impressed, but I wasn't sure why we needed all those details. We just need to know why the bee farm is selling or wants to sell. That's what I wanted to hear. 
She flipped her notebook shut and put it back into the bag, only to pull out a big can of hairspray. Don't you? My words were silenced by the aerosol noise coming out of the can. I groaned and grabbed the big towel, throwing it over the food I'd taken out of the freezer before her hairspray could fall on it and ruin it all. Spray that. I let out a deep sigh. Honey, this crazy cold weather will make my hair fall if I don't get it good and sprayed. She threw the can in the bag and put the bag over her shoulder across her body. I've got a few more stops to make about this. She got up and put her coat back on. Norman, nice to meet you. He grunted and shifted side to side on his feet, letting out an audible toot. Aunt Maxie pushed through the door and I hung my head. 7. Can I help you? When I noticed Jimmer and a woman other than Bev walk through the coffee house door, I put down the bags I was ready to take down to the booth to finish setting up for tonight. Jimmer! The muscular, bad-tempered woman jerked the little boy's arm. Hurry up and pick out a treat. I'm in no mood to deal with you after I had to deal with that thing you call Mimi and my dad. Norman ran back into his cage when the woman's boisterous voice scared him. I almost ran there, too. Hi, Jimmer. I put on a chipper attitude, hoping it'd outweigh the woman's mean attitude. How about I give you a special treat to give to Norman? I made them especially for the dogs. I reached over and pulled one of the bags of the dog treats I'd put together for the Pet Palace booth with the Beanhive and Pet Palace business cards. Thank you, Roxy. His little hand reached up and took the bag. We don't talk to strangers. The woman grabbed the bag from him. Hi, I'm Roxanne Bloom. I extended a hand. Jimmer's been in here a few times. I'd hardly call myself a stranger to him. He's been here all week. Fine. She shoved the bag into his chest. He grabbed it before it fell to the ground. I was happy to see him smile when he took the treat out of the bag and Norman stuck his head out of the cage. Why don't I get you a special treat? I suggested to the woman. You look like you could use a little you time. It was hard, but I had to be nice to her for Jimmer's sake. You have no idea. She sighed and her eyes softened. I love my son and I've missed him, but there's just something about my dad that turns my key the wrong way. Your dad is wrong? I asked and put together this was the woman Bev had told me about. I see he's been talking about me. What did he say? She planted her hand on her hip. He was saying how I'm the black sheep of the family and he had to give me a job because I was a loser. Not Ron, but Bev might have mentioned it, I thought. Oh, no. I shook my head and put the special ingredients in the bottom of the mug to make her a nice hot cup of the salted caramel coffee, maybe with an extra shot of caramel. They've just been enjoying the week with Jimmer. (laughs) My dad, she scoffed. Enjoy a week with Jimmer? Lady... She circled her finger in front of me. You are not a very good liar, because my dad doesn't enjoy anything unless it makes him money. And trust me when I say that he didn't hold back telling me how much Jimmer has cost him this summer. I'm sorry you feel that way. I pushed the to-go coffee across the counter. The quicker I could get her out of here, the better. On me. Thank God, because I have no money. I work for the SOB to pay back debt I owe him and my step-monster. She lifted her hand to her mouth, palm side out, and said, She's the one who convinced him to stop paying for my car and my rent. Does Bev look helpless to you? I, uh... I had to stay neutral because they all seem nuts to me. Right. She's not helpless. She just won't get a job because my dad pays her way. Her eyes started to look crazy, and her voice started to escalate. Here's the deal. She doesn't know that my dad has an insurance policy on him with me as the beneficiary. Not that I wish the sperm donor dead, but I can't wait to see her face when his will is read and my name is on it. I tried to wrap my head around all the crazy she was spouting, but just blinked the entire time. Oh my gosh, this is good. She closed her eyes and inhaled deeply. You know, she circled her finger around the mug. My dad should really put one of your stands in the resort he's building here. She plucked a business card from the holder next to the cash register. I'm the head decorator, and I think this is amazing. 
She looked at the card before putting it in her back pocket. Come on, Jimmer, let's go. Jimmer jumped up. I quickly put a sugar cookie with sprinkles in a bag and handed it to him. He smiled at me and I returned the smile, hoping he'd seen it before he was dragged out of the coffee house. Who was that? Kelly bobbled her head back and forth to get a good look at them before they got out the door. A mean, nasty woman who we might be seeing more of if we can't talk Andrew and Kayla out of selling the bee farm to them. Listen, do you think you can just close the coffee house after these guests finish their tea and bring the rest of this stuff down to the booth? I've got to head over to the bee farm before it's too late. Yes, of course. I've got the dogs. Go! She practically shoved me out the door and flipped the sign to closed before I could. Thank goodness I wore a sweater under my coat because the temperature was dropping fast and going across the lake on the ferry would only be colder. Loretta Beebe was stacking hay bales on top of each other along the boardwalk. Babette Cliff was right behind her, propping up the fodder shocks, followed by Jean Hill placing potted mums on top of the hay. The finishing touches the beautification committee had planned for the festival were really coming together. Good morning, Loretta. I chirped, hoping she was in a good mood. You never knew with her. Roxy! She rushed over, her eyes all in a flutter. Did you hear about a resort? Your Aunt Maxie got me so hot my teeth started sweating in this cold weather. She waved her hands in the air. I told her there is no such thing happening. I've not heard it on the beautification committee, and nothing, I mean nothing, gets past me. She threw her hand to her chest. I swear that Maxine Bloom is trying to make me have a nervous breakdown so I can't be re-elected as president. That was a mouthful, I joked. I processed what she was saying and was sad she didn't have any news about it. She always had more news than the Tribune. From what I've heard and understand, there's a company in town that's looking at the bee farm to purchase some property. My words punched her in the face. It contorted and she snorted and she was almost shaking. I was just on my way down to the marina to see if Big Bib has a ferry going over to the bee farm soon. I want to ask Andrew and Kayla for myself. She bit her lip and drummed her fingers on her chest. Well, I'll be a possum on a gum bush, she cried out, brows turned down and shaking her head. Honey Springs can't turn into another Gatlinburg. It's awful down there. I like Gatlinburg, but I'm with you. I think our small town values family and community. Big companies, not so much. Though I knew there'd be a good boost in jobs, I just wasn't so sure it belonged on the bee farm. I'm more concerned with why the Noros would be selling the land if they didn't have to. Oh, Roxy, I never thought about the bees. She moved her hand from her heart to her head. I saw it on Oprah how the bees were dying out. Oprah? I questioned. Oh, honey, if it's on Oprah, it's the truth. She fluttered those lashes so fast she could start a windstorm. Mm-hmm. She said the bees were dying out. She nodded and fiddled with her hands. Roxy, honey, I've got to go. She yelled over to Jean. Jean, you got this? I've got to go. Jean gestured Loretta to go on. What was that about? Jean asked me when I walked past her, and we both watched Loretta lumbering down the boardwalk. I thought Oprah is off the air, I muttered under my breath with a shrug. I'm sure Loretta is getting stuff done for the festival. She's been running around here like a chicken being chased by Colonel Sanders. Jean tweaked a brow. I can get more done without her here, so whatever it was you said, thank you. <laughs> I'll see you later. I waved by and headed past Touched by an Angel Spa, where the sidewalk sign advertised a honey spa special during the festival. It sure would feel good to be doing that instead of nosing around over at the island. I waved at Emily Rich when I passed the Bee's Knees Bakery. She held up a cute bee-shaped cookie with a little black mask on its face. I gave her a thumbs up. So tickled her business was going great. The Buzz In and Out Diner was packed. 
In the honeycomb salon, Chrissy was chomping away on her gum while cutting someone's hair with Alice D. Spicer looking on. The front windows of the Wild and Whimsy were decorated with festive pumpkins and large brown and green vines twisting all around. There were several antique seasonal decorations on display, and I was sure they'd sell out. The marina was right down the ramp next to the boardwalk. Several slips were occupied by boats that had already been winterized. Big Bib was the owner. He had a shop that sold things for boating, but if you wanted to purchase bait and things of that nature, you'd have to visit the bait and tackle shop on the pier. Roxanne Bloom, how the heck are you? Big Bib was reclining back on two legs of the plastic chair, propped up by the wall of his shop. I'm good. How are you? I asked. Fair to middling. He nodded and pushed off the wall, setting all four legs of the chair down on the ground. But you don't come around down here unless you need something. Yes, I wanted to know if you could ferry me over to the bee farm, I asked. What's so interesting about the bee farm these days? he questioned, standing up and sticking his hands in the pockets of his overalls. That's what I'm hoping to find out. I had another question. Since you are the only fairy, has an outsider by the name of Ron Harvey said anything to you? I knew Big Bib talked everyone's ear off when he had them on the ferry, and I was sure he'd question Ron. Yep. He brought his large hand up to his beard and brushed down. His dark eyes looked at me. He mentioned something about his business here. You mean putting a big resort on the bee farm? You can't possibly be on board with that. You of all people. Big Bib didn't like a lot of change. When I opened my coffee house on the newly renovated boardwalk, he just couldn't understand why anyone would buy such expensive coffee. He's got a good thing, Bib shrugged. Wait, did he? I pointed to the ferry and back to Bib. You're going to be the only fairy over if he does build this resort. He gave you a deal to get your vote on the town council. I can see why you were a lawyer. He smiled under his facial hair. Bib, I can't believe you'd sell out like that. I was in shock. Of all people, Bib was the last one I figured would want a big resort. Roxy, I've got to think about my retirement. I don't want to keep this marina until the day I die. I'd like to just hang out in my cabin down the lake and enjoy a little fishing, that's all. He put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a boat key. I'll take you on over now if you got the time. Oh, I've got all the time in the world. I wasn't only shocked about Bib, I was boiling mad at how conniving Ron Harvey was. I'd seen it when I was a lawyer when these bigwigs come into little towns and swoop up property, only to go broke in a few years, leaving an empty building behind. Ron was already going behind the town council's back and trying to get people on board with his big ideas and money-making plans. I wasn't going to let that happen to Honey Springs. The bee farm took up the entire island. There were many trails and different stops along the way where Andrew had posted signs about which bees lived where. They had devoted the entire island to the species, and the thought of this not being here anymore was something I couldn't wrap my head around. Andrew and Kayla had a nice building on the island with a roof shaped like a honeycomb. It was very unique, and the tourists loved to have their pictures taken in front of it. There was also a live band and several honey-tasting stations, They also sold their fresh honey there on the island. Roxy, didn't you see the sign on the marina that said we're closed for the festival? Kayla met me outside of the building. She must have seen me coming up the trail. Her shiny brown hair with Medusa-like waves floated behind her. The bee farm tee tucked into her khaki pants showed off her narrow waist. I did, but I came by as a social visit to find out what's going on. I didn't wait to ease into it. Kayla and I were friends. We did business together. I've been hearing you're selling. She sucked in a deep breath and glanced over her shoulder. It's not me, it's Andrew. Some of the bees aren't producing, and we need to get new queens along with new colonies. Each colony costs around $200, and to replace the production we've lost would take thousands of new colonies. Her voice cracked. We just simply didn't save enough. Andrew said that we have no choice but to sell part of the land. But to a resort? I asked with a pleading tone. He's given us a lot of money. 
I really don't see a way out of this one. She looked down at the ground and pushed a leaf around with the toe of her shoe. We've let Honey Springs down. No, you haven't. I reached out and squeezed her hand. Wait! I yelled, making Kayla jump. I know the citizens don't want you to sell. We love our bees. We love you. Do you think you could hold Andrew off from signing any paperwork? They're going to sign tomorrow morning at the Honey Springs National Bank. There was no hope on her face. What if I can get the beautification committee to agree to donate all of the proceeds of the festival to you and Andrew? Would you be willing to work with Evan Rich at the bank to use the money wisely to slowly add the colonies you need? It was a far-fetched idea, but one that could save the bee farm if I could get everyone on board. Do you really think the community would do that? Her eyes sparkled a little. If you think you can hold off on signing the contract, I'll do everything I can to help save the bees. I smiled and squeezed her hands. I can, she nodded, the frown on her face transforming into a big smile. I've got to go. Big Bib is waiting for me on the ferry and I've got a lot of work to do. I let go of her hands. I'll see you tonight. We waved goodbye. That was quick. Big Bib had thrown a line in the lake. I didn't even get a bite. Hurry up. We don't have time for you to fish. I sat down in one of the metal folding chairs and snapped my fingers. Bib took his place behind the wheel, and I took the opportunity to send a group text to Loretta and all my friends who owned shops on the boardwalk about how we could help save the bee farm. Even if Loretta wasn't on board, our small shops could give and at least put out a jar that was labeled for the bee farm. Aunt Maxie. I called Aunt Maxie, who wasn't good with texting. I've got a scoop for you and your gossip column. I quickly told her what I was doing, and she said that she'd go to the businesses in downtown Hunter Springs and get them on board. She also said that Loretta Beebe owed her a favor, since she gave the committee free ad space for the festival in the Tribune, so she'd call on the beautification committee about donating the festival's proceeds. Roxy, you've got something up your sleeve. Bib looked me over with a cautious eye. I wasn't going to tell him anything. He was on the wrong side of this as of right now. You look a lot happier now than you did when I dropped you off at the bee farm. Bib, I'm hunky-dory. I winked and jumped off the ferry as soon as it hit the dock. 8. There was one thing I needed to do before I went to check on the booth at the festival. Go see Chrissy Lane. Chrissy had one of the biggest mouths in Honey Springs. She was a hairstylist at the Honeycomb. She had the gift of gab and a real hankering for gossip. There wasn't anyone better to spread the news about the Save the Bee Farm campaign because it needed to happen fast. The entire boardwalk was now decorated. Jean wasn't anywhere in sight. There was word around town that she'd gotten the horses in their big wagon to give hay rides between the Cocoon Inn and Orchard to go to the pumpkin patch. I couldn't wait to go with Patrick. Chrissy was still where I'd seen her through the Honeycomb's window before I went to the bee farm, only she had a different customer in her chair. Chrissy's sun-kissed blonde hair was definitely man-made and probably done by her because she had been a natural redhead when we were teens. She had befriended me when I visited Aunt Maxie during those summer months. Now that I'd moved back, we'd become good friends and I knew that I could count on her to get the word out. Roxy Bloom, have you come in here to get your hair done? She chomped on her gum, the red freckles across her nose spreading along with her smile. She stuck her hand on her hip, the comb sticking out from her fingers. I need to talk to you about the bee farm. My phone chirped with a text from Kelly. She had already made a few signs to post around the festival and sent me a photo. I quickly texted her back to make multiple copies on the copier at the coffee house and to start to distribute them to the neighboring shops. Oh, Lordy, Loretta Beebe came in here having a duck fit over it, Chrissy fanned herself. Are y'all hot or am I having my own personal summer? Menopause, honey, the customer said. I'm not even 30. Chrissy gave her the wonky eye. You better go see a doctor then. The customer licked her finger and flipped the pages of the Southern Living magazine in her lap. Go on, Roxy. Chrissy started back cutting her customer's hair. All eyes and ears were on me as I told the story about the big resort trying to take over our little island and running away the bees. 
Within minutes, I had everyone on board and even got a donation from the customer in Chrissy's chair. You know, I'll tell everyone I know, she nodded. I'll go get one of our mason jars from the back and put it next to the register. Alice D. Spicer rushed behind the thin sheet they used as a door to the supply room. There was no time to spare. I'd planted the seed with Chrissy and was sure of her success. When Ron and Bev Harvey saw just how much the citizens of Honey Springs didn't want them here, I was sure they'd forget all about their resort. Where have you been? Penny Bloom, my mom, was waiting for me at the booth on the beach in front of the Cocoon Inn. I still have a business to run. I gave her a hug and looked around. Patrick had already put two cafe tables under the white tent. There was a small pot of red mums in the center of each table, along with bean hive business cards. He'd set up the two glass bakery cases. One was refrigerated and buzzing, and a mini coffee and tea bar was next to the cases. Kelly hadn't brought down the coffee carafes yet, but there were a few pastry treats in the case. The hay and scarecrow were a great way to cover up the tent's poles and provided extra seating. There was a box with my name on it behind the glass case filled with paper cups, napkins, and to-go bags with the cute beanhive logo on it, where the body of the bee was an actual coffee bean. Why didn't you tell me about your big client? I eyed her over the glass and started to arrange the cups. There is nothing to tell. He's a jerk. He said that he only wanted to talk to me because of my knowledge of Honey Springs. Mom was hotter than stolen firecrackers. She was all riled up. After I told him that I'd only lived here for a few months, he turned into a real jerk, saying that I wasted his time and that he had a realtor that did his bidding for him. He even said that I couldn't make a good deal. Mom, he is a jerk. You make amazing deals. Now it was personal. In fact, I've made it my mission to make sure they can't buy the bee farm. Do tell, Mom gushed, grabbing a pastry out of the case and taking a big bite as she leaned her hip on the glass. While I worked and Kelly made a couple more trips back and forth, I told Mom about how I'd gotten Loretta and the beautification committee on board to have all the proceeds of the festival go towards the bee farm. I even showed her one of the flyers Kelly had designed. She's taking them to all the shops and booths down here. There's way more tourists than the one Ron, so if we can just raise a few thousand dollars, I know Andrew and Kayla will hold off on signing the contract. At least, that's what Kayla had told me. I'm going to call all my clients. Mom picked up her phone. I'll see you here later. Mom already had her phone up to her ear talking when she left walking towards the cocoon inn. She didn't even stop to talk to Kami as they passed each other. You've really gone above and beyond to save the bee farm. Cammy looked so much happier than she had this morning. You've got Ron Harvey all in a flutter, and I love it. I'm so glad. Maybe he'll leave before the party. I wiggled my brows and finished putting what was left in my box on the counters. Did Babette happen to bring my costume to you this afternoon? Yours and Patrick's, she laughed. You're terrible, she referred to my costume. Nah, just a little joker, I winked. Tell me, how's the afternoon gone with Ron? It's not Ron that's driving me crazy. It's his cuckoo daughter. She hates him more than I do. Kami shook her head. I've got to get in costume before my guests start coming down to the hospitality suite. Oh, what are you dressing as? I asked. We're going as the Munsters. I'm Lily, Walker is Herman, and Amelia wanted to be Cousin It. She laughed so hard. Walker's got Amelia glued to the channel on the television with all the old shows. Amelia loves Cousin It. That is so funny. Where on earth did you get that costume? We rented it from a shop in Lexington. They had tons of old TV characters. I wanted to be Miss Kitty from Gunsmoke, only with a real gun to shoot Ron Harvey. But you... She shook her finger and hesitated. You're going to be the talk of Honey Springs. Only if I can pull it off, I grinned and waved goodbye. Her words reminded me to text Patrick to be here early so he and Sassy could get their costumes on. Nine. Where is he? I paced back and forth in front of Kelly, her father, Pepper, and Sassy. 
The festival was about to begin and I had to be at the booth. The clock read it was 3.40 p.m. and the festival started at 4 p.m. You look great. People are going to die, Kelly laughed. Right, Dad? Are you sure you want to do this? I mean, this isn't going to be a joke to a lot of people. Your Aunt Maxie gives a nice tithe to the church and if I make her mad, you won't. My heart thumped like one of those cartoon characters you'd see on TV when they saw the person they loved. You know, where the heart shape beats in and out of their chest, like when I saw Patrick walk into the cocoon. I had a clear shot of Kami handing him his costume and giving him directions to find me. His reaction was priceless. He started to laugh, and he looked like the teen I'd fallen in love with so many years ago. Kami gave me the thumbs up when he headed into the bathroom. She had Sassy with her. It'll just be a few minutes now. I looked between the very giddy Kelly and a very worried Preacher Mitchell. Here you go. Kami walked into the room with her Lily Munster outfit on and the fresh-cut yellow, red, orange, and purple chrysanthemums, anemones, and asters bouquet Jean Hill had designed for me. I can't believe you're really doing it this way. Patrick walked in, and his eyes filled with tears. He looked so handsome in his black and white tuxedo, it was a perfect fit. You've just made me the happiest man this side of the Mississippi. There was nothing but love in his eyes when he looked at me in the simple V-neck and cream wedding dress that fit tight around my core and then flared at the hem. No regrets doing it with just us? I looked down at Pepper, who was sporting a bow tie, and Sassy, who was wearing a veiled tiara for dogs. Kami is our witness. I have no regrets. He looked at Preacher Mitchell. Let's get hitched. I'm going to sit in the booth so you two can take your time. Kelly's shoulders drew up to her ears and she giggled, running out of the room. I knew it wasn't going to sit well with Aunt Maxie and Mom that I'd chosen to get married without them. I was all for peace for the rest of my life instead of trying to figure out who was going to sit where as the mother of the bride. I did love Aunt Maxie as a mother and went to her for more advice, but Mom was still my mother and I loved her too. It was my second wedding and Patrick didn't care as long as we got married. I'm sure Debbie would be thrilled for us. After the festival, I'd let the three of them sit down and plan a big reception. I didn't care what it would be like. We'd let them have at it. Preacher Mitchell said the usual verses and gave a couple minutes speech about love. I tried to focus on his words, but it was Patrick's deep eyes that reeled me into a trance that I never wanted to be broken. Kami had gone above and beyond in decorating the room. I told her that I just needed a little room, but she shut off the hospitality suite with a sign saying it was closed due to the festival. She'd had Babette bring down an archway that Jean had decorated with all sorts of white flowers and a little greenery. The lights were off and the curtains pulled to darken the room and let the ten candelabras holding ten candles each, a total of a hundred candles, provide the romantic lighting. Kami had even decorated the mantle above the fireplace with the same flowers in my bouquet and thick antique candlesticks with tapered white candles. There was soft music in the background. She'd picked up a couple of simple wedding rings from the jeweler downtown that were perfect for the occasion. Walker and Amelia slipped in. Walker had taken a few photos for us to remember the crazy occasion. Then you may kiss your bride. Preacher Mitchell said the magic words at the end of the ceremony. Patrick bent down, his lips meeting mine, gently covering my mouth. Raising his mouth from mine, he gazed into my eyes. It was a perfect moment. I now pronounce you Mr. and Mrs. Patrick Kane. Preacher Mitchell finally had a smile on his face. Now for the gifts, Kamey butted in. Walker and I are giving you the honeymoon suite for the next couple of nights. Oh, no, we couldn't. Patrick reached into his back pocket to retrieve his wallet. Don't, man, Walker stopped him. The two of you have done a lot for us, particularly Kami. This isn't even enough to thank you. I'm going to take you on a proper honeymoon. Patrick couldn't stop smiling, and neither could I. He swept me off my feet and into his big, strong arms. I guess we have to wait to use that room until later. I held on around his neck. 
We've got a festival to get to and a bee farm to save. I don't care, Mrs. Kane. He kissed my nose. As long as I'm with you, I'm happy. He snuggled me closer as we got to the door, overlooking the beach where the festival was in full swing. The beach was busy with people dressed in sweaters, coats, and even a few gloves. You sure do make a pretty couple. Newton was hunkered down on the opposite side of the stairs since I last saw him. Newton, what on earth are you doing? I wasn't about to let go of Patrick's neck. I wanted him to hold me as long as he could. I still don't have all these mums planted around the building. I've got the pots sitting around so it looks like they're planted. He lifted up his spade. I did have all them done until Kami lost her mind about the rumored resort, and she doubled the number of mums. You do beautiful work, Newton. Patrick smiled and turned back to give me a kiss. We stood there looking at the crowd. The hayrides had started. Kids were bobbing for apples. The kids' games were full of youngsters in various costumes. Everything I loved about living in Honey Springs was right here in front of me. Community. I'm not letting you out of my arms for the next couple of days, he whispered into my ear as we made our grand entrance into the bean hive tent where Mom and Aunt Maxie were sitting at one of the tables with frustrated looks on their faces. Ha ha, Mom rolled her eyes. Look at them, Maxie, shoving our faces in it like two-year-olds. You mean like Mr. and Mrs. I wiggled my finger with the small gold band on it up in the air. It's not nice to tease an old woman, Aunt Maxie sighed. I'm not joking. We aren't just dressed up as a bride and groom. We just got married. I held my breath and waited for the explosion. Mom and Aunt Maxie stood up. They looked at Patrick. He held up his hand and wiggled his ring finger. I didn't know anything about it. Roxy planned it all. He was talking fast. I helped, Kelly bounced on her toes. Me and my dad. Preacher Mitchell did this to us? Aunt Maxie's chin lifted, and her eyes drew down her nose, still looking at my ring. I couldn't choose, I butted in. I love you both so much, and it wouldn't be joyous if I had to plan a wedding listening to you two argue. Patrick and I love each other so much. I've loved her since the day I laid eyes on her at your house, Maxie. His voice was soft and soothing. It's just a ceremony to make it official for the rest of our lives. I'm not saying I wasn't shocked when Kami handed me the tux. I was and pretty much still am. But it's having Roxy by my side that makes my life complete, not the ceremony. Patrick and I are going to stay at the Cocoon Inn for a couple of nights, and I'm giving you two and Debbie total control to plan the reception for us. The words barely left my mouth when they jumped and grabbed me. Congratulations, Aunt Maxie squealed in delight. I knew it. Patrick, I made sure your daddy brought you by that day because I knew my Roxy was a perfect match. Huh, you knew that if you got Roxy hooked up, she'd stay here with you. Mom just couldn't let it go. Now we have everything we've always wanted. I looked between them and smiled. I couldn't resist when Kelly made the comment that it'd be funny if we dressed up as a bride and groom one day. Then it clicked. I wasn't for sure going to go through with it, but when I was with you two at all about the details, I knew I had to at least try to pull it off. Was Babette in on this? Aunt Maxie questioned. Yes, she was. I nodded with delight over my perfect plan. Tweedledee and Tweedledum walked into the booth. I'll have a coffee, one of the Tweedles said in a strange voice. Me too, the other Tweedle said in a higher voice. You make a pretty bride. If only we could get you to pick a date. Bunny, is that you? I looked deep into the eyes I recognized. Maybelle? Ta-da, they said together. Ta-da, I yelled and wiggled my ring finger in front of them. I'm no longer on the market. Patrick and I got married today. What? Bunny pulled the mask off her face. Why didn't I get an invite? I bet it was her. Maybell tugged off her mask and glared at Aunt Maxie. Hush up, you old coot. Aunt Maxie balled up her fist and showed it to Maybell. No one was invited. I quickly explained to them how it all went down and gave them a cup of coffee to help wash it down. 
So you two can start planning any time. Don't ask me what I want or ask Patrick. You just get with Debbie and plan it, I told Mom and Aunt Maxie. Get with Debbie about what? My new sister-in-law walked up. Timmy had already eyed the ghost cookies Kelly had made for the trick-or-treaters. Look at you, Sheriff. I bent down and hugged my nephew. I'd like to say I'm surprised. I reached up and got one of the cookies to hand to him. Timmy was always dressed in his cowboy boots, sheriff's badge, and cowboy hat. He was bent down, patting Norman. Honey, be careful, Aunt Maxie warned. If you stand down wind from him, it'll buckle your knees. He's fine. I gave Aunt Maxie a good hard stare. We're working on that issue, aren't we, Norman? Norman looked up at me and grunted. Y'all are cute, Debbie gestured between me and Patrick. If we could just get you hitched. We got hitched, sister. I smiled and held out my hand. You know how you mentioned the Justice of the Peace the other day? Patrick! Debbie threw her hands up to her mouth and jumped around. Timmy, Roxy is now your aunt! I know. Timmy had no idea. It was so cute. I love her. I love you both. Debbie's eyes teared up. Wait, there's a dress and a tux. Was I not invited? Patrick took his sister by the arm and they took a little stroll. He was going to fill her in on all the details and about how she was going to have to deal with Mom and Aunt Maxie to plan the reception. After a few minutes, everyone we loved settled down about the wedding. Patrick took the dogs for a walk, and I had to work. The line for a hot cup of coffee was long and leading out of the tent. Kelly had made extra hot chocolate for the kids to enjoy while the parents waited in line for their specialty drinks to be made. Since we weren't in the coffee house, I didn't have several machines. I had to do one specialty drink at a time. It was fine with me. I was able to look at all the little ghosts and goblins, including the four-legged ones. The more I talked to them, the more they gave to the bee farm fund. Aren't you the blushing bride? Spencer Shepard's deep green eyes looked me up and down, his wallet in his hands. I'll have a pumpkin spice latte. I never figured you to attend a fun festival unless there's been a crime, I joked. Kelly grabbed a cup and started to make his latte. I'm not a bride for Halloween. I'm Mrs. Patrick Kane. We got married right before the festival started. He lifted his hand to his chest. Roxy, I'm hurt. You didn't ask me to be your best man after all the time we've spent together. He put his hands in his pockets. His sandy blonde hair curled around the edges and hung over his ears. It was true, since I'd opened the coffee house, there'd been a few crimes that I'd been a little curious about. I blamed the lawyer and me for that. Still, I was pretty proud of myself because I had uncovered more clues than Spencer's entire sheriff's department. Nope, Pepper did that. I laughed and took the drink from Kelly. No one was invited. Even the groom was surprised. I was still pretty pleased I'd pulled it off. But we're having a reception, and of course you're invited. I handed him the coffee. Nice sheriff's costume. I was hoping Timmy would be my deputy tonight, he smiled. Congratulations, Roxanne Bloom Kane. I'm sure y'all be happy. I'm telling you, he's lost his mind. I overheard a conversation between two men dressed in business suits standing behind Spencer. I'll see you later. He held his cup up in sort of cheers gesture. I nodded. Businessmen, nice costumes. I smiled and looked between the two men when they stepped up to the counter. We are businessmen. The man looked confused behind his wire-rimmed glasses. His thin blonde hair was cut short and tidy. He had a long, pointy nose and pale skin. Oh, you mean the party. Can you believe he wanted all of us to dress up for this thing? He smacked the guy next to him with the back of his hand in a friendly gesture. Both of them laughed. Did you hear Sharon? The pointy-nosed guy asked. No, what did she say? The shorter one twirled his finger around his ear, gesturing Sharon was cuckoo. She told Ron he'd have to give her more shares if he wanted her to dress up, and how Bev has ruined Jimmer's summer. The guy rolled his eyes. It's not the first time she's threatened him since he's let her back in his life. I heard she barely missed his head with that two-by-four on the Rocky Mountains work site. My ears perked up. I knew they were talking about the relationship between Ron and his daughter. 
It was much worse than I thought. Yes, we are actually businessmen. The other guy laughed. He had thick black hair that was also neat and tidy. He had a small nose that held up black, thick glasses. He was about four inches shorter than his friend. We'll have two macchiato lattes. He reached around to his back pocket and took out his wallet. Is it always this cold during Halloween? The pointy-nosed guy asked. This isn't good weather for a lake. I'm sorry, who are you? I asked and let Kelly start their drinks. We're here on business with the Harvey Foundation. He confirmed what I was thinking. I told Ron he was going to have to dig so deep to hit bedrock over there. The shorter guy took the money from his wallet and handed me a $100 bill. Can you make change? Of course I can. I tried to be nice and on my best behavior. My insides were churning. There was anxiety rolling around in my head, begging me to get the words out and tell them we didn't want their company here. To answer your question, the seasons in Kentucky aren't typical. We might have snow tomorrow and 80 degree temperatures the next day. Is that so? He asked as if he didn't believe me. See? He hit the guy again. This isn't a great investment, and I'm not going to let him waste my shares on this podunk place. I don't care if he wants to cater to families. He took the change from my hands. Can you believe he's actually trying to act like he's a family man when he can't stand to be with them? <laughs> yeah, Julie is going crazy at headquarters. I told her that she needed to switch jobs and get out while she can. He had me questioning who Julie was. She needs to stop sleeping around within the family. Here you go, Kelly handed them the lattes. Two macchiato lattes. Nice costume, the shorter of the two men pointed and winked at me. Oh, he picked up the jar with the Save the Bee Farm flyer next to it. You're not going to save the bee farm unless Ron Harvey is dead, and he just had his physical. That man has the body of a 30-year-old. The other guy laughed. Yeah, he has to keep up with them young girls. Look over there. He pointed to Ron and his daughter, having a fierce argument near the apple-bobbing bucket. Poor Jimmer and Bev were looking back and forth between them before the daughter stormed off towards the cocoon inn, with Ron running after her. "'What was that about?' Kelly asked as we watched them walk off. "'Not sure, but can you take their order? I need to write something down.' I pulled my phone out from my pocket and walked over to the side of the tent for some privacy. I quickly used the notes app in my phone to write down Julie's name and how they'd made it seem like Ron wasn't faithful, which didn't surprise me. I also noted how they asked me about the weather and talked about how Ron wasn't a family man, plus the man saying he didn't want his shares going towards this resort. Bedrock. I made a note of that, too. These were things I could give Aunt Maxie to check out for her article. After all, she was standing right there watching the entire argument unfold. If we couldn't save the bee farm with donations, at least we might be able to dig up dirt that'd get the citizens involved to stop the town council from letting them build. What are you doing, Mrs. Kane? Patrick walked over with Chrissy. He was so handsome that I'd swear if it weren't so cold, I'd have melted right there. I was going to check out my nephew and sister-in-law over at the apple bobbin buckets. I nodded, and when he looked away, I slipped my phone into my bra. It was the only place to stick it in this dress. The v-neck provided quick access. Shall I accompany you? He stuck his arm out for me to take hold of his elbow. Yes, Mr. Kane, you shall. We giggled and kissed before we made our way over to them. I could just sop him up with a biscuit. Chrissy gave a few mm-hmms and pointed to Spencer. He was walking along the beach and handing out sheriff badge stickers to the kids. You're killing me. I laughed and dodged several little ones, trying to get a piece of candy from Loretta Beebe. I done told you one per customer. She fussed with the Batman who had a handful. One per customer. Aw, oh, come on, Patrick teased when we passed her. Batman needs the energy. Nice costume, she said. Not a costume, I held up my finger. We got hitched. You, what? Wait, Loretta yelled. She jumped up and put her bowl of candy on her chair. She ran up alongside of us. What do you mean that you got married? 
Loretta, baby, I swear, you ain't that silly acting. Aunt Maxie scolded her, even though they were adults. They got married today. Did my invitation get lost in the mail? Loretta drew back with the most offensive look on her face. Aunt Roxy, will you bob for apples? Timmy tugged on my dress, leaving a little dirty fingerprint. Don't touch, Aunt Roxy. Debbie stood in sheer horror. Of course I'll bob for apples. I patted his head and got down on my knees. I looked up at Patrick and he smiled, joining me. I will too. He gave me a kiss while Timmy did the three, two, one, go countdown. Pepper yipped in delight, but Sassy sat there like she couldn't believe we were doing this. Truth be told, I felt like Sassy was Loretta in dog form, only a little warmer. Patrick and I plunged our faces into the cold water, and all I could think about was one of my pumpkin spiced lattes to warm me back up and I wanted to take advantage of the sweet Kami and Walker had given us in the cocoon inn. A shrill scream echoed off the trees, vibrating in my ears. I jerked my head out of the water just as the screaming carried out of the cocoon inn. Aunt Maxie had her cell phone out, taking photos of me and Patrick. Did you hear that? I asked Patrick, both of us soaking wet. Everyone went running up to the inn. I wasn't far behind them, and Spencer Shepard was right by my side. When we got closer to the inn, we noticed someone running away from the inn in the opposite direction from the festival. Stop right there, Spencer yelled. Police! I said stop! The figure continued to run and disappeared around the back of the inn. Did you see that? Aunt Maxie grabbed my arm. The hair was long and blonde. It sure did look like that woman who was fighting with Ron Harvey near the apple bobbin. Aunt Maxie said exactly what I was thinking. Why was Ron's daughter running away? 10. Ron Harvey's dead body was found in the hospitality room beneath the archway Jean Hill had decorated for my wedding. A thick candlestick with blood on it lay next to his head. I glanced from the candlestick to his head and saw where the two had met with force. Patrick must have known my thoughts because he rubbed his hand up and down my back. I even felt sorry for Bev. She was kneeling down, kissing his face, her tears dropping on his body. Spencer had roped off the crime scene once the backup deputies arrived. Apparently, he hadn't had any luck finding Ron's daughter. Are you sure it was the daughter? Spencer asked Aunt Maxie. As sure as I'm standing right here. She stomped a foot. She's got that long hair and is pretty tall. Plus, they were having an argument not ten minutes before she killed him. Those are some mighty big allegations, Maxie. Spencer was taking notes on his little notepad. I've got me one of them. She tugged her notebook out of her bag. See here? I've been taking notes on this guy, and Roxy has been too. Ain't that right? She turned her head over towards me. Is that right? Roxanne Bloom sticking her nose in other people's business. Shocker, he said flatly. You two stay right here. He dragged his pen between me and Aunt Maxie. Do you mind if I change back into the clothes I wore here? Patrick asked me. No, go on, I'm fine, I assured him and gave him a goodbye kiss. The dogs rushed off with him, although Pepper did linger a little, looking at me with his big eyes. This sure wasn't the way I figured I'd spend my wedding night, I said to Aunt Maxie, and watched as Spencer cleared the entire foyer of the hotel. He said a few things to Kami and Walker. This is going to be good for sticky situations. I took photos, you know. Aunt Maxie straightened up when Spencer came back over to us. Are you two comparing notes and gossiping? He asked. We aren't gossiping, I shrugged. He didn't need to know what we were saying. That's right. Aunt Maxie drew her chin real high up in the air and gave one big nod. We were discussing our prayers and concerns right now. Aunt Maxie's lips curled together, and we all bent our heads when the coroner took Ron's body out of the room on a church cart. Daddy, Sharon whined. Daddy, Daddy! She screamed so loud, goosebumps crawled along my spine. Spencer held up a finger for us to hold on. What did you do? She screamed at Bev. Spencer walked alongside Sharon, talking so low I couldn't hear him. 
She continued to nod, and when they met Kami at the door of the hospitality room, Kami took Bev and Jimmer out into the hallway. I didn't kill my father, Sharon screamed at Spencer. I've been in the bar having a stiff drink, she said through clenched teeth. You better find out who killed my father. I'm going to have to ask you to stay here for a few minutes until I can check out your alibi. Spencer walked back over to us. Why? I asked. Because people tell you things. He squinted at me and asked, Why do they tell you things? Because I'm nice and I have good coffee to talk over. I nodded towards the coffee station in the room. Would you like some? I joked. I'm good, thanks. He huffed a long sigh. I'm going to regret this, but why don't you tell me everything you know about this family? The daughter said she's got an alibi, and I'm going to check it out with the bartender. You want me to tell you everything? I asked, looking over at Sharon, who definitely had a motive, especially since she'd told me about that policy only her and her father knew about. It's going to take a while. Spencer ran a hand through his hair and looked as though he were considering something. Why don't I finish getting Kelly set up to work the rest of the festival tonight? I'll go back to the coffee house, put on some fresh coffee, and change my clothes. I was happy to see through the windows that the festival was still going on. You can come on down after you get the crime scene cleaned up. It won't be for a while, but I can still process a few things while you do all of that. He moved his attention to Aunt Maxie. Are you going to go with her? Yes, I am. There was no getting rid of Aunt Maxie. She was stuck to me like a booger. Then we will see you soon. I had to get Aunt Maxie out of there so we could compare notes. Plus, I wanted to know what she'd heard while Ron and his daughter were fighting. Aunt Maxie and I slipped out of the inn and scurried towards the boardwalk. There were some noises behind us. When I turned around, Mom and Chrissy were hurrying after us. We've got company, I whispered to Aunt Maxie. We stopped and let them catch up. I know what you're doing, Roxy Bloom. Um, Kane? Chrissy giggled. If you two think we are going to let you investigate this crazy situation, you're nuttier than a fruitcake. What we say between us and what we share is just between us. Aunt Maxie gave each one of us a square look in the eyes. Got it? Got it, we said in unison. Pinky swear. Aunt Maxie lifted her little crooked pinky. We all held up our pinkies and joined them in our little circle. There was dead silence between us. The moon was peeking over the trees, and that told me it was almost 8 p.m. My phone chirped with a text from Patrick right as we got to the coffee house door. I handed Mom the key and texted Patrick back. He wanted to know where I'd gone because he was waiting for me. I sighed, closed my eyes, and pinched my lips trying to figure out what to tell him. It wasn't like I could say that I was at the coffee house, trying to come up with clues to where Ron's daughter had been or why she killed him. I also couldn't lie to my husband on our first night of marriage, or lie to him ever. This marriage thing had really put a crimp in my sleuthing, and this was just the beginning. Instead of texting him back, I called him. Hey, honey. I tried to sound really upbeat. Roxy, you are going to die when you see this sweet. You won't ever want to leave. He was so excited. Give me an hour or so and I'll be right there. The more vague I could be, the better. That doesn't sound good. Where are you? He asked. I'm at the coffee house with Mom and Aunt Maxie. I eased down on one of the stools along the front of the shop and continued to look down the boardwalk toward the festival. Spencer needs to interview us and I thought I'd just come down here, change and clean up a little until he comes here to get my statement. Statement? You didn't see him get killed? Besides, I thought you'd just change here. I can picture him now with a bottle of wine open, the dogs lounging. Our first night as a married couple wasn't going as I'd pictured it in my head. Roxanne Kane, are you putting your nose where it doesn't belong? Let's just say I've got a few things I can tell Spencer to help with his investigation. I didn't want to outright tell him that I was definitely sticking my nose in it, but he knew. It wasn't like he was stupid. Just as long as you're honest with me. He was making it so hard. I'll see you in an hour. Yes, I looked at the time and made a note of it. As long as Spencer has come down here by then. An hour, Roxy. His words were stern. It's our wedding night. I love you, Mr. Kane. 
I turned the phone off before he could make me feel any worse and rejoined my co-sleuths. They'd already grabbed one of the whiteboards I used in the kitchen to write down recipes I made up as I went along. Aunt Maxie had the coffee brewing, and she'd already pulled brownies out of the bakery case that were supposed to be for the next day. These are delicious, Roxy, Chrissy moaned and groaned with each bite. They are perfect for getting our juices flowing. I popped off the top of the dry erase marker. We've got to get to it before Spencer gets down here and tries to stop us. Why are we doing this? Mom asked and picked up another brownie. Because Ron Harvey, dead or alive, still has a company that wants to build a big resort on the Bee Farms Island. There's a reason his daughter, well, we think it was his daughter, killed him, and it can't all be about the volatile relationship they had. I took that moment to write Ron's name at the top of the board and Sharon's name under it. I do know her name is Sharon because two men that are employed by Ron came by the booth. I made bullet points under Sharon's name to list all the reasons. Sharon told me that her father hadn't spoken to her in years. She hates Bev. There's an insurance policy put in Sharon's name. He has to be dead for her to collect on the policy. Then she did it. I mean, she was running away from the scene, Mom said and got up to get coffee when the coffee maker beeped done. But she said to Spencer she's got an alibi. I walked over to the coffee bar and grabbed four mugs. If it comes back that she was at the Cocoon Lounge, then we need to be looking for someone with long hair like hers. I wrote Mystery Woman next to Sharon's name. Did anyone see somebody else with long hair at the festival? We all doctored up our coffees while we thought about it. If she didn't do it, then who? Aunt Maxie asked, bringing the coffee up to her mouth. This is such a good brew. Thank you. I smiled real big. I'm not sure if y'all are going to be on board with the next person that I'm afraid has a good motive. Who? Chrissy rubbed her hands together. I can't wait to hear. His wife? No, she was standing next to me with Jimmer, though she did have good reason to kill him because he was having an affair. At least, that's what I overheard. I decided not to even go there at this time. Kami. What? Roxanne Bloom! Mom acted as though I'd cursed and she was reprimanding me. You need to take that dress off right now. It's squeezing all of those lawyering techniques you spent good money on out of that brain of yours. Hear me out. I put my hands out in front of me. If Spencer can clear Sharon's alibi, he's going to find out that Kami wasn't a fan of Ron. She's been on an active campaign like me to get him not to build and put her out of business. I also kept thinking to myself what she'd said about shooting him. You know, Chrissy hesitated, I didn't see her around the festival. I did see Walker, Iris, and Amelia, though. We need to figure out how to clear her name if she's named a suspect. Then I looked at my mom. Aren't we jumping the gun on this? Chrissy twisted a strand of hair around her finger. Besides, shouldn't you be with Patrick? Which is a good point, Aunt Maxie stood up. I think all this can wait until Spencer says Sharon didn't do it. This is ridiculous, Mom smacked the table. They are right. You need to be with your husband. We all cleaned up here, so it's all ready in the morning. Aunt Maxie picked up a couple of our mugs. You don't have to. I'm paying Kelly to work the festival and close up the shop. Patrick and I are going to clean up the booth in the morning. The more I thought about it, the worse I felt about leaving Patrick in the suite Kami had given us. Then it's official. Mom stood up and outstretched her arms. I got up to hug her. I want you to have the best life with Patrick. Now go. She gave me a little push towards the door. I'll catch up with you tomorrow. Chrissy waved me off with a goofy smile on her face. They were right. Obviously, Sharon was seen running away by practically everyone. The chill running through my body wasn't from the sudden breeze sweeping across the boardwalk. I turned to look back into the coffee house and looked at Mom. She and Aunt Maxie were cleaning up our little coffee party. I just couldn't shake the feeling that something was going to go wrong with the investigation and Mom could actually be a suspect. As much as I tried to forget the conversation we'd had about the exchange she'd had with Ron, the more I thought about how her words made her a suspect. 11. I was about to come looking for you. 
Patrick answered the door in his plaid PJs. He looked so cute with the pups by his side. Well, after a few minutes at the coffee house and talking to Aunt Maxie, Mom, and Chrissy, I knew that I needed to be here with you. I wrapped my arms around his neck to give him a big hug. I thought you said you were waiting for Spencer to come get your statement. He backed away with an odd look on his face. Pepper and Sassy bounced around me when I stepped into the room and shut the door behind me. They followed me to the coffee house to get the scoop and we talked from there. Then I left and they locked up. When I got here, I told Spencer that I'd see him in the morning because he was still processing the scene downstairs. My eyes shifted to the wine glasses, bottle of chilled wine, and the spread of chocolate-dipped fruit on the table. Look at this sweet! Looking at the outside of the cocoon, you would never guess how modern this amazing sweet was on the inside. I bet Kami spent a fortune on this renovation. I ran my hand down the back of a gray chair and looked out the double doors that led to a balcony overlooking the lake. There was a matching gray chair with an ottoman. A small white table between the chairs held a glass vase of fall flowers. The same gray fabric was used on a couch with white end tables and a modern tinted green glass lamp on each side. The carpet was also gray with a darker gray diamond pattern throughout. The walls were light gray with white trim. Around the room, there were several paintings of vibrant red cardinals, the Kentucky State Bird. Very chic, I trailed, and walked into the other room, where there was a king-sized bed with gray and white sheets, with white rose petals sprinkled all over it. I bit my lip in excitement. Another balcony? I hurried over to the double doors next to the bed to open them and look out. The brown, silky curtains added a classy touch to the room. Gorgeous! My voice trailed off when I noticed the men in uniform walking along the beach with their flashlights, no doubt looking for evidence. You're gorgeous. Patrick's warm arms wrapped around me, shielding me from the cold, not only from the outside temperature, but from the feeling they were looking for something, or someone, more than Sharon. I love you, Patrick Kane. I turned around and met his lips with mine. It was finally the night I had dreamed about since I was a teenager, and I couldn't believe it was on the night of a murder. No amount of kissing, holding, and snuggling took my mind off of it. The chocolate-dipped fruit didn't either. On my third glass of wine, I was still hoping to forget, but that didn't work either. My phone chirped with a text from the bedside table. I lay in Patrick's arms in a dead silence, wondering if he was asleep and I could sneak a peek. It was like an itch I couldn't scratch. Go on, see who it is, Patrick groaned, unwrapping his arms from around me. I know you're dying to see who it is and if it's about Ron Harvey. Even though I should be having all of your attention, he said in a joking manner. Are you sure? I asked and smiled when he smiled. I reached across him and grabbed the phone. It's Spencer. I sat up in bed with the sheet curled around my body. He said he looked into Sharon's alibi, and she was in the cocoon's bar all night. Even worse, I glanced up over the top of my phone at Patrick. The light illuminated my face. A wig was found in the flower bed next to the inn. That's the same color and style as Sharon's hair. That means someone other than his daughter hated him. Patrick sat up and looked at my phone screen with me as the text messages continued to roll in. What does it say? He squinted. Patrick? I gasped and slowly lifted my head. I dropped the phone. He wants me to see him first thing. He said I'm not going to like his list of suspects. What does that mean? He asked. It means he's looking at Kami. Just hearing those words come out of my mouth left me with a feeling of dread that I couldn't shake all night long. I refused to even think he was talking about my mom. 12. I watched Patrick sleep the entire night. I wanted my inability to sleep to be about my being excited about getting married, but it wasn't. Spencer's text had thrown me into a tizzy. My head swirled with so many thoughts about Ron and who really killed him because I refused to believe Cammie had anything to do with it. I definitely didn't entertain the notion that my mom had either. I slipped out of the bed and scurried across the suite to the other room, where Pepper and Sassy were each snuggled in a gray chair. 
Neither of them moved when I took a quick shower and threw on a pair of jeans along with a sweatshirt. Even though I was a newlywed, I had not lined up coverage for the coffee house to take a few days off, so I still had to go and open up, and 4.30 a.m. was quickly approaching. Besides, lying around in the dark for another hour wasn't going to help me. My brain was already in lawyer mode. At least I could get to the coffee house and get started on blending the coffee beans and making the pastries. That would help me relax and get my mind working on some of the theories about Ron's death. The Niwala Festival might be over, but Honey Springs was still celebrating the fall season, especially along the boardwalk. Last night's chill and cool breezes had knocked a lot of the leaves off the trees along the lake as well as at the bee farm. The empty tree branches looked like eerie arms jutting out from the shadows of the moonlight, making my feet carry me faster along the boardwalk than normal. The banners on the carriage lights snapped in the early morning wind, a sign of the temperature and weather in store for the rest of the day. It wouldn't hinder the families that would come out for the pumpkin carving contest and all the goodies available at the shops along the boardwalk. The warmth of the coffee house hit me in the face when I opened the door. Norman was standing right at the door, greeting me. It was the first time I didn't have to drag him out of his cage. My nose met with the pleasant smell of cinnamon and pumpkin instead of Norman's smelly issue. Norman, I greeted him and bent down. I think your special food combined with my homemade treats has really helped your belly. He snorted and grunted and rolled over on his back for a good belly rub. I smiled at his little freckled stomach. He was adorable and would make a great companion. You know, I pushed myself up to stand. I think I have a pumpkin suit that might fit you, and if I take you to the pumpkin carving contest, I bet someone will adopt you today. He wiggled his way behind me as I walked through the coffee house, flipping on the switches of the commercial coffee pots. Are you ready? I grabbed a leash from the hook and clipped it on his collar. This time he led me to the door instead of me dragging him. I let him pick the way he wanted to go and got lost in my thoughts, not noticing Emily Rich unlocking the door of the Bee's Knees Bakery. Hi there. Emily's chipper voice caught me off guard. Emily, I gasped. You scared me to death. Really? I thought you saw me since you were coming right towards me, she laughed. Are you okay? I'm fine, just lost in my thoughts. I held up my hand. Did you hear? So it's true, she smiled and shook her head. I can't believe you finally did it. So, why are you here? It was kind of an impromptu thing. Want to go for a walk while I tell you all about it? I asked, trying not to be rude while Norman continued to tug on the leash to get going. Emily joined us on our walk along the boardwalk and over to the green space. I told her all about how I couldn't bear listening to Mom and Aunt Maxie fuss how I'd called Kami to see if she could help pull it off and get me the bride and groom costumes for the festival. My reasoning for the costumes was if Patrick hadn't agreed to get married that day, at least we had costumes for the festival. I think it's perfect, exactly what you wanted, and I hope I get to do the reception cake. She knew better to even think she wasn't. Of course you will. We followed Norman down near the marina, I ripped one of the doggy poo bags from one of the complimentary stations the beautification committee had donated around and in Honey Springs. The death of Ron Harvey hasn't made it as romantic as it sounds. I was trying not to bring that up. Emily held the leash while I cleaned up Norman's poo pile. We didn't get to the festival last night, but my dad got a call from one of the guys that had come into the bank with Ron. He told Dad that Ron had been found dead, but he wanted Dad to know the deal was still on. Guy? What guy? I asked. Did your dad get a name? No, he told Mom that Ron and one of his partners had come to the bank to open an account for the resort. He said after they left, he wasn't sure how long the resort would stay open because the two of them couldn't get along while they were signing papers, never mind running a business. Her words made no sense to me. Did he say anything about his partner? I really wanted to know who that was. The reason I ask is because I think Spencer believes Kami did it. If I can prove someone else is a suspect, then I have to. You're asking for trouble, Roxy. Her face grew still. You can't do this. Remember last year around this time 
when somebody torched your cabin? It was Christmas time and I'm all good, I told her and tugged Norman back towards the boardwalk. Besides, this is also for the good of the bee farm. Which reminds me, I've got a few dollars to give you towards the fundraising. It's not much. The critters along the lake chirped and sang as we walked across the boardwalk. It all adds up. I was hoping now that Ron was killed, the company wouldn't be interested in moving forward with the deal, and we could have more time to raise the funds needed to keep the bee farm open. I silently fumed at the very idea of them building that resort. Hopefully they'll find the killer. I hate that he's dead. He was a father, grandfather, and husband, according to the newspaper. She stopped in front of her shop and grabbed the Honey Springs Tribune that had been delivered in the short time we'd taken Norman for his walk. I'm not sure he was good at the other things, but he was good at being a businessman. A light bulb went on in my head. I knew that if I researched his businesses, I'd find some sort of dirt to show Spencer that there were people other than Kami who had motive to kill him. Congrats again, Emily hugged me. I'm so happy for you. Thanks, I'll catch up with you later, I said over my shoulder, because Norman was really dragging me along. You must be hungry. Norman was happily eating away the kibble I'd put in his bowl on my way back to the kitchen. The ovens were set to preheat, and it was five o'clock. I'd taken a much longer walk than I wanted to, but at least I'd learned some information from Emily that I could chew on and look into. The Harvest Blend coffee had brewed, and a big cup was calling my name. I pulled out the dry erase board we'd used from the night before to write down the information Emily had told me and put a big X through Sharon's name, since Spencer had made it clear she had an alibi and wasn't a suspect. It took everything I had to write down Kami and Penny, my mom, as suspects, neither of which I could imagine as a killer. It was like a recipe I just couldn't get quite right. I had to see it in writing before I could throw in the ingredients. It was how my brain was wired, and I knew that if I stared at a recipe long enough, it would come to me what ingredient I was missing. With each sip of coffee, I gained the courage to just write it all down. As much as I hated to even put the words out there, I had to do it in order to get a sense of what I was dealing with. It was the exact same process I'd used for clients when I was a lawyer, except this time it was way too close to home. Under Kami's name, I made bullet points and listed what I knew to be her motives to kill Ron. The big one was the fact his resort would either slow down business at the cocoon or result in the end closing. The second thing I wrote down was how Ron had baited and belittled her in front of not only her guests, but her husband and granddaughter. I did leave out the fact that she'd threatened him in a conversation with me. Under my mom's name, next to her bullet point, I wrote down how she had a beef with Ron, about how she couldn't have knowledge about Honey Springs since she'd not grown up here. He'd insulted her, and she didn't like that. Was that a motive for murder? I wasn't sure, but I did know people killed for much smaller things than that, and funny stuff happened when someone was scorned. I wrote a big question mark in the column next to Mom's information. This represented the guy that had gone to the bank with Ron. He was a business partner of Ron, I wrote down. Under that, I wrote how they'd had an argument at the bank. The oven buzzed, causing me to break out of sleuthing mode and into barista mode. The coffee house still had to open, and I had to get the pastries in the oven. When I walked into the freezer, I looked down the row of frozen baked goods. Honey Springs was going to need some good comfort food, and this time of year was all about pumpkin, cinnamon, spice, and chocolate. Well, to be fair, any time of year was good for chocolate. I decided to grab two maple and walnut upside-down cakes, along with a few bags of apple and pear strudel. Both of these would be perfect with a cup or two of my Harvest Blend coffee. I'd also picked one of my specialty desserts, pumpkin and white chocolate mousse pie. I had planned to bring it out for a special treat after the fun of the three-day festival to lift everybody's spirits after all the hullabaloo, but today was calling for it. While I let the rest of the pastry thaw on the cooling rack, I put the scones, muffins, cakes, and strudels in the oven. I picked up my coffee and glanced over at the whiteboard of suspects. My first investigation would be into the guy who went with Ron to the bank. 
But before I could even do that, I had to get the sidewalk sign out on the boardwalk and ready the coffee and treats for the cocoon in. Burr, it's cold out there, Bunny Bowowski said as she pulled the full-length shawl from around her shoulders, her pocketbook swinging from the crook of her elbow. She waddled over to the coat hooks, hanging up her shawl. She had a smaller shawl on underneath, which she put over top her apron after she secured it around her neck and waist. She vigorously rubbed her arms to get the chill off. Good morning. I've got a real treat for you. I wiggled my brows and poured her a nice cup of coffee to help ward off the cold. While I was behind the counter, I switched out the coffee house's carafes for the ones I used for the Cocoon Inn's hospitality room. I have some of my strudel in the oven, and I'd be honored if you tried the first one. I've been waiting all week to see when you were going to offer those things. Bunny had stood over me last weekend while I was making them. She begged to have one, but I knew there'd be a time when we really needed them. That time was now. You sit down and have that coffee first. I can't have you getting sick before the real flu season hits. I pulled up a stool to the counter. I've got to go get the sign. I picked up the sidewalk sign and chalk. After I get this outside, I said and pushed through the door, I've got to get the hospitality treats down to the inn. I'll be fine, but I do have a favor to ask, Bunny sipped her coffee. Can you drive me to Lexington this afternoon when Kelly gets here? I have to return the costumes me and Maybelle wore last night. They don't let you keep them too long or they charge you extra. Of course I will. Now my mind was recalculating how I was going to manage my day. To Bunny, it seemed like I was just running the coffee house, but in my head, I was a bloodhound sniffing out clues in this murder. I had planned where I needed to go and who I needed to see, with coffeehouse work as a front. Now that I had to take Bunny to Lexington, that was a full hour and a half I'd lose in my day. Forty minutes each way, and that was driving a bit over the speed limit. Kelly will be here around three, I believe, I noted, just as the carafes for the cocoon beeped. I wrote the specials on the sign and stuck it out on the boardwalk, even though we weren't open yet. Bunny walked around the coffee house and made sure the coffee and tea bars were stocked. When I was here last night, I noticed Kelly had done a great job of filling up the bars before she'd closed. But Bunny still made sure everything was ready before she headed back to the kitchen to get the pastries out of the oven. She took pride in arranging the morning's items on the cute trays and various platters. She liked to clean up the bakery cases, wiping away any little fingerprints. You've outdone yourself, Roxy. Bunny had streusel topping and icing on her chin. Thank you. I helped myself to one of them before we finished getting ready to open, just in time for the morning crowd. As much as I'd hoped the yummy goodness would help me forget about Ron Harvey, it only made me want to find out more. 13. The news of Ron Harvey's murder was the talk of the bean hive. When I left Bunny to drop off the Cocoon Inn's goodies, she was already gossiping with Maybell Donovan. The wind had picked up and blown off what was left of the leaves on the trees. They danced in many whirlwinds along the boardwalk and skittered across the lake. I wasn't sure if the eerie feeling I had was the haunted vibe of the season or if the murder lingered in the air. But I did know that the thought of Ron sent chills along my spine. The beach in front of the Cocoon Inn was bare, all the tents and festival games had been put away for next year. If there was going to be a festival next year, I wasn't sure if the events that had taken place had changed anyone's minds. I sure hoped not. According to the note Kelly had left about the bank deposit, which I told her to take home to her father so he could put it in the bank, the bean hive had had a good night. The bean hive always did good. We were the only coffee house on the boardwalk, just like the Cocoon Inn was the only place to stay on the lake other than the rentable cabins. When I walked into the inn, there wasn't anyone at the desk. The police tape had been removed from the doorway to the hospitality room, and all the wedding things had been cleaned up. What a memorable wedding that was, I groaned, heaving the coffee carafe up on the buffet-style table. I took out the to-go box and arranged the pastries on the platters already put there by Kami. I walked over to the mantel where the wedding had taken place. Images of Patrick taking me as his wife were burned into my memory. I couldn't wait to see the photos Walker had taken of us. They would be our first thing I'd get framed and put into our house. Our house. 
Was it going to be my cabin or the house Patrick had bought from Aunt Maxie? Both were beautiful, but the cabin was where my heart was. But as long as I was with Patrick, I was also home. Maybe I'd just run up to the suite and check on him and the fur babies. Shuffling behind me caused me to come out of my thoughts. When I turned around, there were already guests getting their complimentary coffee and goodies. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Newton skedaddle out the front door, making me forget about going to see Patrick. When I pushed the door open and stepped onto the porch, Newton had just rounded the corner of the inn. Newton, I called. He turned around. He had on a pair of overalls with brown gardening gloves in his back pocket. Good morning, Roxy. I'm going to need some of your good coffee today. It's going to be a cold one. He pulled the gloves out of his back pocket and put them on. You can have as much coffee as you want on the house. I glanced down where he'd already replaced the summer landscaping with a long row of colorful mums. Ha! Oh, are you trying to butter me up? He grinned, narrowing his eyes. Yes, I am. There was no sense in sugarcoating it like I did my blueberry muffins or specialty coffee drinks. I noticed you were planting mums yesterday, right outside the window of the hospitality room where Ron Harvey was killed. I sure was. Darndest thing I ever saw. He shook his head. Can you tell me about it? I asked. Well, like I told the sheriff, I didn't hear a thing. I had my earphones in, but I felt it. He nodded. Felt what? I wasn't sure what he was talking about. The person nearly knocked me down when they went running past. I thought for sure it was a woman, but when I went around the corner to see what on earth was wrong with her, I found the wig. Not only did my jaw drop, but a frigid breeze caused me to clutch the top of my coat around my neck. Did you say a wig? I wanted to make sure I'd heard him correctly. Yep, just like the color of the hair of that girl the sheriff took in. He grabbed the spade sticking out of the earth and started to dig. Did you see her running away? I asked. I'm not sure if it was her or not. I did see someone running towards town. He pointed the spade the opposite way of my cabin. It was a dark figure with dark clothing. I'd say it was the killer. Did you happen to know where Kami was? I asked. Nah, I guess she was inside. Just a few minutes earlier, I was digging around, planting these darn mums, when I heard her and that man fussing like the dickens. He dug a little bit more before he reached over and grabbed one of the potted mums. He knocked it loose from the pot and used his hand to break the roots before he put it in the hole he'd made. Her and Ron? I wanted to make sure Newton and I were on the same page. The dead man. He brushed the dirt he'd unearthed around the mum and patted it down. He told her that he didn't care how much she tried to fix the landscaping by planting all this stuff, that he was going to open the resort whether she liked it or not. She spouted off about our small community and how there was a fundraiser to save the bees. He laughed at her and called her a hillbilly, and that's when she smacked him, telling him that she'd never let him open that resort. Kami smacked him? I gulped. If she could slap him, she could definitely have been mad enough to kill him, out of anger. Yes, ma'am, she sure did. He dug another hole, repeating the same process with the next mum. I stood up after she smacked him. He took a look at me and told her that he'd have to be six feet under before she could stop him. Oh, my. I gnawed the inside of my cheek. Do you remember anything else about the person you saw running away? Nope. Just what I told you I saw. His lips pinched. Where is the wig? I asked in case he still had it, which was a long shot. Spencer took it. He said it was evidence. He shrugged. I say it was someone pretending to be that man's daughter. I'll let you get back to work. I shoved my hands in my coat pocket. I had to agree with Newton about someone wanting us to think it was Sharon who killed her father. Be sure to grab some coffee. Will do. He went back to landscaping, and I walked around the inn to face the beach. Patrick, Sassy, and Pepper were taking a walk down by the lake. The sunrise over Honey Springs Lake was hard to compete with, but they were the best thing I'd seen all morning. Pepper heard my footsteps and ran up to greet me, followed by Patrick and Sassy. Good morning, my wife. Patrick smiled and kissed me. Are you finished for the day? 
Actually, I didn't plan this whole day after the wedding thing too good. I wasn't lying, but if we got technical, we both knew I could have taken the day off with little notice. Bunny is down there now, while I came here to deliver the hospitality room treats. Kelly will be in after school. How did you sleep? Fantastic. He stood behind me with his arms holding me, both of us looking over at the bee farm. Sassy put her nose between us. She didn't like not having Patrick to herself. She was in for a rude awakening. Although we were looking at the same thing, I was sure we weren't thinking the same thing. He'd continued to talk about how great it was that I'd planned the impromptu wedding, while I continued to think about that wig. You didn't answer my question about today. Are you off? He asked, not getting the hint when I dodged the question. No, I sighed and turned around to find Patrick with a frown on his face. You know how it is to run a business. Yeah, but Debbie is covered since I just got married. Weren't you there? He stepped away from me. Patrick, what if we meet up for an early supper after I get back from Lexington? I slipped it in there, hoping he'd not heard. Lexington? He heard. Bunny needs me to drive her to Lexington to drop off her and Maybelle's costumes from last night. I gave him sad puppy dog eyes. I probably should have thought the whole wedding thing through a little better. Are you kidding me? He reached for my hand and ran his finger over my ring. I love how you did it without even thinking. I thought, I corrected him. You might have thought about the wedding, but not the days after. He finally smiled, making me feel a little better. I'd love to take you to a nice supper. Then you're all mine for our last night in the inn suite before we go home. Home? There's that word again. What about the watershed? He asked. Pick me up at the coffee house. I have a change of clothes there and I'll be ready. I patted my leg and whistled for the dogs. They loved coming down to the lake where they found a lot of different things to sniff. I'll take them with me. You can go back to the suite and rest for the day. Roxy, he pulled me close to him. If you don't think I'm on to you about this murder, you're wrong. I know that if Ron hadn't been killed, you'd be off work in a minute. Am I that transparent? I asked, knowing I needed to be a little less, in case Spencer could sense it when he showed up to do my interview as he'd promised last night. No, you're Roxanne Bloom Kane, and I know you better than anyone. You can't stand to let it go unsolved, especially now that I do think Kami is a suspect. He heaved in a deep breath. I saw Spencer put her in his car. She was cuffed. What? My jaw dropped. Why didn't you tell me? I figured you knew. You always know before anyone. Maybe she needs a lawyer. Was that his way of making it seem better that I wasn't at all going to stop now? She for sure needs a lawyer. I whistled louder. The dogs came running. Don't worry, I'll still be ready for supper. We kissed. I'll walk you back to the coffee house. I need a coffee. We strolled hand in hand. This was something I was really looking forward to, when all this mess with Ron was over and the Harvey Company was run out of town. Sassy and Pepper knew exactly where to go. There was a leash law in Honey Springs, and I probably should have had one on them, but no one cared. At the moment, I didn't care. I had to get back to the beanhive and see if Bunny had heard anything about this so-called arrest, if that's what Spencer had done. Pepper! I turned towards the pier before I went into the coffee house. Jimmer and Sharon were walking from the pier towards the coffee house, which was at the intersection of the pier and the boardwalk. Sharon, I wanted to give her my sincerest condolences. Her eyes were sunken in and dark underneath. Her hair looked like a cat had been chewing on it. I'm so sorry to hear about your dad. Hey, Squirt, she rubbed Jimmer's hair. Why don't you head back into the bait and tackle shop and pick out a piece of candy? Why don't I take you to fish off the pier? Patrick suggested. He knew I was going to be snooping. He could read me like a book. I've never fished off a pier. Jimmer bounced on his toes. Can I, Mama? Sure, Squirt. She gave Patrick a slight smile of gratitude. You've got yourself a good one, Roxy, she said while we watched Patrick take Jimmer down to the bait and tackle at the end of the pier where Patrick would rent a couple of poles and buy some worms. Sassy and Pepper were happily at their sides. Pepper loved to walk the pier. Sassy just loved being with Patrick. I knew how she felt. 
I'm not sure how many fish they'll catch, but I did catch a good one. I fiddled with my ring. Is there anything I can do for you? Do you really want to help? She asked. Yes, anything. I sure wasn't expecting a real answer. Boy, was I surprised. Help us find out who killed my dad. She was dead serious. This really perked me up, almost as fast as my dark roast. I heard you were a lawyer, and I'm afraid the police aren't going to find out who killed him. At first, they thought it was me. It wasn't. I have a very tight alibi. She lifted her hand to her head. If you haven't noticed, I've got a very bad hangover. Do you have any idea who might have done it? I asked. Everyone I know that could have done it has been cleared. The police dragged all of us down last night to give our statements. If it weren't for Jimmer, I'd still be in bed. Bev is zoned out on some sort of sleeping medication, so she's no help right now. Her eyes teared up, shocking me a smidgen. I hate that I took Jimmer and went to explore the town. My dad wanted to keep him for the day. He wanted to rent a boat and let Jimmer have fun on the lake. Although it was cold out, Jimmer wouldn't have cared. We both looked down the pier. Jimmer and Patrick entered the bait and tackle shop. It was so cute watching Patrick with kids. We definitely wanted children of our own one day. Jimmer has had a really good time with them while they've been here. I tried to offer some words of comfort. I've seen them all week. Your dad really loved him. Thanks, Roxy. The sound of laughter filtering down the pier caused us to turn. Jimmer was proudly holding his own fishing pole while Patrick was explaining each part. Patrick loved explaining the details of everything, but Jimmer was too excited to listen. He was too busy fiddling with the pole. At least your dad set you up with an insurance policy, even though your relationship was on shaky ground. I wanted to get a little nosy. It was all because of Jimmer. My dad married Bev, and it seemed like he cut me off. Yeah, I was in my 30s, and I had Jimmer, but still, he'd always paid for everything. I swear it was Bev who wanted to blow through his money, with her expensive tastes in clothes and purses and lavish vacations. There was more of a deep-set hurt in her words than anger. She put her elbows on top of the boardwalk's railing and leaned over, looking out at Lake Honey Springs. When I told him I knew it was all Bev, he kept denying it. Didn't you have a job? I was having a hard time siding with her. If she was in her 30s, didn't she already have a career established on her own? I've had various jobs, but still he's my father and I should have been taken care of. There was the temper I'd heard Bev speak of. She felt entitled to it, if you were to ask me. He just cut me off. No warning. I was stuck with the bills that needed to be paid. It wasn't until my marriage started to fall apart and I filed for bankruptcy that my dad came around. I'd remembered the two businessmen commenting how Julie needed to stop sleeping around within the family. After you split with your husband, is that when your dad came back? I asked. Yeah, apparently Dad didn't like him, and he figured I needed help now that I didn't have a husband to take care of me. We met up, and I let him see Jimmer. They'd not seen each other for a couple of years. We talked, and he asked me about my financial situation. It was then that he told me he had a spot for me at the company, and how he'd made me the beneficiary in a life insurance policy for my later years. She waved to Jimmer after he yelled her name and pointed to the fishing pole. Do you like working for the company? I asked. Yeah, I mean, I get to make all the decisions on the interior decorations, and I love that. But when I hear Bev's voice, it just brings me right back to the couple of years of hell I had when she cut me off. There was no way, not even after her dad's death, that she was going to accept the fact that it was her father who had cut her off and not Bev. Where do you and Bev stand now? I asked. Bev has old money. She's taken care of, and she's got no stock in the company, so I'm sure she'll just drop out of our lives, which is fine with me. They live in her house, so there's no reason for her to move. Sharon pushed off the railing and stood up. I'm sure we won't ever speak again after the funeral. If Bev didn't have any stock in his company, she had no motive to kill Ron. Why would she? She had her own money. No matter how I felt about my dad at this time yesterday... He's still my dad, and I will always regret how I yelled at him last night. Her voice trailed off. A frown appeared on her face. I saw that. What happened? I asked. 
Like I told you, he was mad that I didn't meet him and let him take Jimmer for the day on the lake. It was selfish of me, and I wanted to punish him for letting Bev spend so much time with Jimmer while they were here. He promised me that he'd spend the days with Jimmer and the nights looking into the resort. She had regret in her voice. Jimmer told me that he spent his days with Bev and that he had to listen to her fuss about my dad like I did. It was clear that Sharon had realized how much they had put Jimmer in the middle. Will you still work for the company? I really wanted to know if I was going to have to butt heads with this woman once they realized how far I was willing to go to stop them from building the resort. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to recommend that I take over now. Sharon's eyes brushed past my shoulder. Honey! She screamed and flailed her arms, practically knocking me down to get to the man coming toward us. He had short brown hair. He was wearing a very wrinkled overcoat and held a suitcase in one hand. He set it down to wrap both arms around Sharon. I took my time walking back towards them. Mike Hogan. He stuck his hand out. He had a firm grip. Roxy, this is my husband, Mike. Husband? I forced a smile. This family was so messed up. Mike, this is Roxy, the lawyer turned coffee house owner I was telling you about. I really think she can help us. I've heard things, you know. I laughed. Sure, I just got off the red eye and really need to get out of these clothes. He brushed his hand down Sharon's face. You okay, baby? I'm fine. I just hope that no one ruins what's coming to me. It didn't go unnoticed how Sharon was more worried about her inheritance than her father getting killed. Where's my boy? Mike asked. He's fishing with Roxy's husband, Patrick. She snuggled up on his arm. They just got married in the same room where Daddy was... Honey. He curled her head toward him as she started to cry. Baby, you know I can't stand it when you cry. Sharon muffled a few words I couldn't make out. It was time for me to leave and let them console one another. Plus, I had to hurry inside to read over what Bev had told me about Sharon's husband. Roxy... Sharon called after me before I opened the door to the coffee house. Spencer Shepard asked me the same thing about who I thought might have done it. I told him my dad's goonies that are here, but they seem to have alibis. Still, I can't help but think they had a hand in it. We'll talk later. I gave her a slight wave and headed into the coffee house. What was that about? Bunny was standing at the bar along the window, wiping it down with a rag. There were a couple of people in deep conversation on the couches by the fire, sipping their coffees. I'm not sure. I noodled the thought in the back of my head that told me Sharon wasn't as innocent as she wanted me to believe. But I have to write some things down. I'll be right back. Write a ham and bean soup. It was Bunny's way of telling me to make more. And your chai tea, she trilled. I exchanged my coat for an apron on my way into the kitchen. Norman was in there sleeping next to the steel workstation. He popped his head up when he heard the door swinging. Hey, Norman. I grabbed a pumpkin dog treat from one of the cooling racks and bent down. How are you? I pinched a piece of the treat off and gave it to him bite by bite so he'd engage with me. He grunted and gobbled up the treat. If you stay in here all day, no one will see you and take you to your forever home. I was beginning to doubt anyone who came into the coffee house was going to adopt Norman. Don't you want to live in a warm house and be petted and loved on all the time? I put my nose in the air and sniffed around. There were no lingering effects of Norman's uncanny scent. I think you're cured. I rubbed him a couple of times before I walked over to the sink to wash my hands and grab my whiteboard on my way back. I looked over what I'd written so far. There was so much to write under Kami that I felt bad and took my time walking over to the freezer to get out the pre-made ham and bean soup. There's just no way that Kami killed Ron and Spencer is crazy to even think so, I said to Norman. She loves that inn. She just got married and she'd never do that to Amelia. I popped open the lid of one of the two large containers I had taken out of the freezer. She's truly very happy. I can understand her frustration, and it doesn't look good that she slapped him. But kill him? I grabbed one of the larger pots hanging above the island and put it on the stove. I don't think so. I bent down, pushing the button, and watched the gas flame come to life on the burner. Then there's the man Sharon was talking about. What man? One of the men in the suits? The man at the bank with Ron? 
I dumped the soup into the pot, leaving it there until it thawed enough to stir. Who do you think did it? Spencer shoved through the door. If you don't think it's Kami. Were you listening to me? I couldn't believe he'd been standing outside the door. Sometimes I think you hold back on me a little, so I do what I need to to keep Honey Springs safe and the investigation going the way I want it to go. But I have a feeling you've got some information for me. He dragged the whiteboard across the table. Good thing you weren't in here a few minutes ago, because I was cursing you for even thinking Kami Montgomery could even hurt Ron, never mind hauling her down to the station in handcuffs. I wasn't going to let him think he could waltz into my coffee house and not get a piece of my mind. Which makes me think that you aren't sure Kami did kill him, or you wouldn't be wasting your time here or on the investigation. Norman walked around the table and stared at Spencer. Who's this little guy? Spencer bent down, completely ignoring my very lawyerly comment. That's Norman. A light bulb went off in my head. I know you must make good money, and Norman needs a good home. Aren't you lonely at night? No way, no how can I take care of a dog. He pushed that brilliant idea I'd had right on out of the way. I can barely take care of myself. Oh, come on, you need to soften up a little, and Norman can do that. I grabbed one of the silicone spoons and sat it next to the pot. The man at the bank? He laughed. Who's the man at the bank? You think I'm not good at this, but I am. I leaned against the island, crossing my arms. I've been replaying last night over and over in my head, so much so I couldn't sleep. The two men that talked about Ron and his affair with Julie, I started to say. Affair? He cocked a brow. You didn't know? I asked. He took out his little notepad and flipped through it. No one said anything about an affair. He didn't look up. He just kept thumbing through it. There's a Julie that's his secretary. Are you sure you were awake when you woke all of them up in the middle of the night to take their statements? I asked on my way over to the dry ingredient shelf. The chai tea was a customer favorite. My special blend consisted of cinnamon powder, star anise, fennel seed, nutmeg, ginger, cloves, peppercorns, and a some loose leaf tea, plus a little sugar to taste and a cinnamon stick to stir. It was delicious and perfect for a cold day for my non-coffee drinkers. I have to serve warrants to get this information and you just serve them coffee. He threw up his hands. I don't get it. Well, I do. I held up a finger. I'll just grab us a couple of coffees. I need a little pick-me-up. My brain was already tired, and we weren't even halfway through the day. Everything okay in there? Bunny lifted her chin and looked down her nose. I don't like how he just waltzes in here now that you're a married woman and all. It's fine. I grabbed a couple of strudels and a couple of cups of coffee, placing them on one of the silver trays I'd gotten from Wild and Whimsy. I've got the soup on, and I'm getting ready to mix the chai tea blend. I took pride in making my own coffees and teas. It was an artistic outlet for me and helped me to think. It had been a lot better if Spencer wasn't there, so I could talk out loud and formulate different theories in my head. Debbie Kane told me how Ron Harvey came to see them at Kane Construction, wanting to know about all the committees and permits he needed to go through, I went to all the planning and zoning committee members. I went to the bee farm. I've gotten all the warrant information to the judge. He picked up the treat and took a bite. When will I learn to just come and see what you know first? I don't know, but after four times of me helping, you'd think you'd learned. I laughed, making a mental note to call Debbie. There were two men at the booth last night. They worked for Ron and didn't have a lot of nice things to say about him. Ron was having an affair with the secretary. The daughter tried to hit him with a two-by-four on a Rocky Mountain project, and Ron was trying to pretend to be some sort of family man. People can fool you. Take you, for instance. He pointed at me. Lawyer. He pointed to the coffee cup. Coffee shop owner. He pointed to the whiteboard. Detective. See, you've transitioned into three people since you've been here. Why, Spencer Shepard... If I didn't know better, I'd think that was a slight dig at me. I stirred the bean and ham soup, then turned it down to simmer. Again, 
If you didn't see some value in what I had to offer, you wouldn't be here. By the way, that's the lawyer in me. Fine, you win. He adjusted himself on the stool and took a sip of his coffee. I made my way back over to the island and made some chai tea bags for the tea bar. If I didn't have some out in the coffee house soon, Bunny would be in here giving me the stink eye. Here's the deal. Kami has no alibi, said Spencer with a sigh. She had a couple of arguments with Ron Harvey out in the open, and in some of them he made remarks about over my dead body. Those are pretty harsh words. Then she slaps him. It got physical. Out in the open, I smacked my hand on the island. Someone saw her having these conversations and knew she'd be a good person to frame for the murder. Spencer sighed again. What? It makes total sense. I mean, if I were to kill someone, I'd definitely find someone who hated that person as much as I did and make it appear like they had the motive. She slapped him. Someone had to have seen it. I put the bags in a bowl to carry out to the coffee house, but enjoyed some of my coffee first. You could be right, but the facts are the facts. He was killed with that big candlestick on the mantel. He looked down at my ring. Oh, so if I hadn't gotten married, the candlestick wouldn't have been there? Nope, but I do want you to know that I'm happy for you and Patrick. All in all, he's a good guy. His comment was one to be ignored. Thanks, but what about the wig? I asked, bringing the conversation back to the investigation. How did you know about that? He looked surprised. Newton told me. I leaned my elbows on my hip, my coffee cup in my grip. What makes you think Sharon didn't do it? Maybe she did. Maybe she wore a wig and threw it down to throw you off. I could see on Spencer's face he was noodling the idea. Besides, she's still with the husband, who also had an affair with Julie the secretary, according to Bev, who you can't leave out either. Did she have an accomplice who killed her husband? I took a sip. See, your evidence doesn't hold water right now, and you wouldn't be here to get a statement from me if you didn't have doubts. That is why you're here, right? Did you see anything? He clicked his pen and put it down by the notebook. Not a thing. I was bobbing for apples when I heard the scream. We took off for the inn, and that's when we found Ron like everyone else, candlestick and all. My brows rose. Any prints on the candlestick? There were some prints lifted that didn't match Kami's or Babette's. Their prints make sense, because Kami got it for the wedding from all about the details, which is Babette's business. When I asked Babette about the candlesticks, she gave me a long list of weddings she's used it in, and we're having to go through all of those people to get their prints and rule them out. He had his work cut out for him. Then I wondered about your mom. My mom? Are you nuts? A huge sigh of frustration escaped me. Again, not a murderer. Before you get on that high horse of yours, hear me out. He put his hand out in front of him. She was also overheard having words with Ron. She wasn't at the inn at the time of the murder. I thought back and realized he was right. I didn't see her after she and Aunt Maxie had fussed at me about the reception they were planning when Debbie was there. She said she went back to the real estate office and started getting together some ideas for your reception before Maxine could beat her to it. He smiled, probably thanking the Lord he wasn't the man I married. It was going to be a challenge having Aunt Maxie and my mom for in-laws. Poor Patrick. From Penny's internet history and the security cameras from various downtown businesses, we can tell she was exactly where she said she was until way up into the night. That gave me a huge relief since I knew Mom couldn't stand to even look at Ron Harvey after he'd told her she had no knowledge of Honey Springs. I wasn't so sure Mom could hold back like I knew Kami could. So, you can erase her name from this whiteboard. He laughed and stood up. About that wig. He bent down and petted Norman. Again, not real sure where it comes from, but there's a lot of hair inside of it. We sent it off, hoping to get some DNA from the hair fibers. If we only knew where it had come from, then we'd have a leg up. 
there was a moment of silence. A tactical strategy I'd learned in law school was to say nothing because sometimes silence was golden. I was sure Spencer had learned that same thing at the police academy. When there was silence, the other person felt as though they needed to talk. It was something used by the police in interrogation rooms and by lawyers with their clients. It was when things were said just to end in uncomfortable silence that the juiciest details were spoken. Neither of us fell for it, but I did tell him I'd be down at the station to see Kami today. 14. I was relieved my mom wasn't a suspect because her mouth had gotten her in trouble a lot over the years. I didn't have my mom's urgent need to become angry, but I did get my curiosity from her, otherwise known as sticking my nose where it didn't belong. It certainly didn't belong in this murder investigation, but Kami was my friend. She'd helped me out more than I could ever thank her for. My business tripled after she suggested I put treats in her hospitality room. Her guests would be walking around all the little shops on the boardwalk or enjoying festivities put on by the beautification committee, and they would stop by for a cup of joe or a sweet treat since they already knew my coffee and pastries from Kami's Inn. Plus, it made me feel better about myself to think my nosiness about Ron's death was helping to prove Kami's innocence. You haven't been yourself since Spencer left. Bunny was putting away the bowls and cups from the lunch crowd and late afternoon customers. I'm fine. I just hate that Kami is down at that station when I know she didn't have anything to do with it. We both looked up when Kelly came through the door. I keep playing different scenarios over in my head. Are you talking about the murder? Kelly asked and put her backpack behind the counter. She hung her coat up on the hook in exchange for an apron. I heard Kami was the main suspect. Do they have solid evidence? Not really. I mean, she did smack Ron across the face after he'd insulted her several times. I shrugged and untied my apron. Bunny also took off her apron and retrieved her heavier shawl and pocketbook. Her fingerprints are on the candlestick, which is the murder weapon, but there are also a lot of other fingerprints on it since Babette used it in a lot of weddings. We just had the coolest lesson on fingerprinting and how to lift them off with wart cream. Kelly's voice was bursting with excitement. Science class, I asked. Yeah, my teacher used to be a cop and he's got all sorts of fun stuff up his sleeve. I love it so much that I just might go into law enforcement after I graduate high school. The enthusiasm poured out of her as she went on and on about the wart cream experiment. So we could do this at home? My mind swirled with so many ideas. "Mm Mm-hmm, she nodded. Crazy. The bell over the door dinged. Loretta Beebe trotted in. She had on a long tapestry coat with cream-colored pants. Her black hair was freshly dyed and she wore bright red lipstick. Roxanne Bloom, Maxine has made you look low rent. Honey, she waved the newspaper in the air. I don't care if you can't pay your rent. You should never look low rent. Loretta Beebe was the last person I needed to deal with before I drove Bunny to Lexington. Low rent was something a southern gal never wanted to be called. What on earth are you babbling about now? Bunny jerked the Honey Springs Tribune from her hands. Turn to page six, sticky situations. Loretta dabbed her finger in the air. I looked over Bunny's shoulder and gasped when I saw the photo Aunt Maxie had taken of me when my head popped up from the bucket as I was bobbing for apples. Mascara ran down my face, my wet hair was plastered to my head, and my wedding dress was a total mess. Patrick's picture wasn't any better. His shirt was soaked plum through, and a big apple was stuck in his teeth. The two men who worked for Rom were standing behind us, laughing. It's about time, no matter how it happened. I read the headline and inwardly groaned. Bunny handed me the paper after I melted down into a chair at one of the cafe tables. The article talked about my past in Honey Springs and my current situation how I'd met Patrick Kane when I was a teen, and how our love endured after all these years. I'm sure she meant well, but the photo was not flattering at all. As much as I hated to admit it, Loretta was right. We looked like we'd just come from the mud flat. I can't deal with this now. I got up. 
Roxy, there's nothing to deal with. The paper is out for the world to see, and I, Loretta, she referred to herself in third person in her slow southern drawl, am mortified for you. Why don't you go on and go, Kelly suggested. You look like you could use some fall fresh air. Thank you, I mouthed to her and grabbed my coat. I also took the newspaper off the cafe table and stuck it in my purse. I'll be back for Pepper and Sassy. No one for Norman? Kelly asked and looked over at the fireplace where all three dogs were snuggled together next to the warm fire on a big dog bed. Not yet, but I do have someone in mind. I turned to Bunny. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. She waddled behind the counter and grabbed the bag Maybell had left with the costumes in it. Loretta was still looking at the bakery case, as though she were trying to decide what she wanted with her afternoon coffee. It was a regular thing for Loretta to come in this time of day. She liked to keep an eye out for all the things the beautification committee had done since she was the president. "'Are you okay?' I asked Bunny and took the bags from her when we started walking down the boardwalk to the parking lot. Since I mostly drove my bike to work, I'd let my car sit in the lot for a week now. I probably needed to take it home. Home. There was that word again. Where was my home? Something I'd have to explore later. I'm tired today. Last night I was up too late. She shuffled alongside of me. Me and Maybelle couldn't stop talking about that man's murder. Why don't I take you home and I can run to Lexington and back in no time, I suggested. It was the least I could do. She'd always been so good to me. Are you sure? she asked. A few short minutes later, I dropped off Bunny at her little cottage home right off Main Street. When I was driving back down Main to take the back country road to Lexington, I couldn't help but see through the windows of Honey Springs National Bank that Evan Rich was in his office. I whipped my car into the parking lot and pulled into the first open space. Roxy, I hear congratulations are in order. Evan Rich met me out in the lobby of the bank. Emily told me the good news. Thank you. I know everyone's a little stunned that we did it that way, but there will be a reception soon, and I hope you'll be attending. I smiled. I read that in the Tribune today, he laughed. About that, I opened my purse and took out the paper. I know Ron Harvey came in here the other day to open an account. The bee farm. We do have many donations coming in. Not that I want to lose the big business the Harvey Company will bring to the bank, but like you, I love our small community. He rambled on about how the explosion in technology hadn't really touched our small town. Yes, thank you for doing the fundraiser for me, but that's not what I came here to ask you about. I opened the paper to the Sticky Situation article. Can you tell me if either of these men standing behind my oh-so-flattering wedding photos was with Ron when he came in? And why am I not surprised you're looking into this? Evan asked. I know, I rolled my eyes. Kami Montgomery is Spencer's number one suspect, and the lawyer in me won't let it die. I know that you've been so great helping in the past few cases I helped out in, but now I need to know about these guys. Evan took the paper from me and stared at the photo. He shook his head. No, I'm about 95% sure neither one of them was with Ron that day. He glanced up at the bank security system. In fact, I can't even pull it up on the security cameras to see the transaction because we had the security company in here switching us to a better system that day. Our cameras had to be down while they were working. That's okay. As long as you're positive neither of these two was with Ron Harvey the day he came in to open the account. Do you remember a name? Is it on the paperwork? I asked. No and no, he replied. In fact, they didn't even open an account that day. They came in here and inquired. They couldn't agree to disagree. He shook his head with a smirk. I've never seen two men in business that hated each other so much. How do you know they hated each other? Now I had to find out who this guy was. They argued from the time they walked through those doors until they left. I watched them leave and they were still arguing on their way to the car. He handed me the paper back. The only reason I can't say with 100% certainty that it's not him is because the black and white photo is a little grainy. Thanks, Evan. You've been a big help. I waved goodbye. I sat in the car for a few minutes looking at the unflattering photo. 
The only employees of Ron that I knew were his daughter and the two men that had stopped by the beanhives booth at the festival. Unless... I whispered and glanced out the windshield, wondering if there was a last-minute guest that had checked into the Cocoon Inn that we didn't know about. I knew who would know. Kami. Fifteen. The boardwalk was only about a seven-minute bike ride from downtown Hunter Springs and an even shorter trip by car. The revitalization of the boardwalk had helped boost Hunter Springs' economy as well as the spirits of the community's residents. The clean country air swept through my hair in a cool breeze. The fragrant smells of fall and the bluegrass curled my nose and put a big smile on my face. There was nothing better than clean air. The downtown area of Honey Springs was compact like the boardwalk. The first building was the Honey Springs Church. Next to that was the firehouse and police station where I'd needed to go to talk to Kami. Across the street from the fire and police stations was the Moose Lodge, which was right before the big circle in the middle of downtown, Central Park. Central Park hosted events like the Farmer's Market and our annual Christmas festivities, just to name a couple. Along Main Street were Brant's Filler Up, Clessinger Realty, where my mom worked, the courthouse with City Hall, Donald's Barber Shop, and the local community college. There were other shops around Central Park, and I was so happy to see they'd gone all out with decorating for the festival. It was the perfect time to stop by the police station and make good on the little visit I told Spencer I was going to make. There wasn't much to it. A couple of cells located behind a few desks, and Kami Montgomery, sitting in a chair, butted up to one of the officer's desks playing cards. "'You look like you're a hardened criminal,' I joked, when I noticed Kami wasn't as distressed as I'd pictured in my head. "'Excuse me, that's my lawyer,' Kami laid her cards down. "'Now, don't you be looking at my hand. I'll be right back.' "'Spencer said you'd be by,' the officer nodded. "'What on earth?' I asked with big eyes when Kami walked over, taking me by the elbow and dragging me into a corner of the station. Seriously, I'm not saying Ron didn't have it coming to him, but I didn't do it, she whispered. You've got to help me. First, stop saying things like Ron had it coming to him. In fact, stop talking entirely. I knew it was going to be difficult for her, but she had to do it. Sometimes talking makes you look guilty. But I didn't kill him, she muttered. I know that, and you know that. I began watching her body language to confirm it. I'm working on it. I have to know if anyone with the Harvey Company had checked in that night that wasn't his family or the other two businessmen. No one. She had bright eyes with hope in them. Ron had paid up front for a room for each of the businessmen he'd brought with him. One for his daughter when she got there. Our only other suite, besides the honeymoon suite, was for him and Bev. She smacked my arm. How's the honeymoon suite? Great, huh? I love it, but we've got to talk about Ron. I changed the subject back. Are you sure? Because Evan Rich said a man came into the bank with Ron to open an account, but it wasn't either of the men I met at the festival. I'm positive. She was certain. Do you think the man from the bank is the killer? Maybe. I'm considering anybody other than you at this point. Do you recall anything else that you might have remembered about his interaction with his family? I was grasping for anything. Unfortunately, nothing. She curled her lips together. Hearing that the number one suspect didn't have any leads herself wasn't something her lawyer wanted to hear. I was hoping for some sort of lead that I could explore but Kami had nothing. By the time I'd made it to Lexington, I'd almost convinced myself the mystery man was innocent, and the facts against Kami were enough evidence to at least get a conviction. Maybe I just need to stick with making coffee, I said to myself, and put the car in park after I pulled up in front of the costume shop where Bunny had rented the costumes. Good afternoon, returning? The woman behind the counter was barely visible. There were hundreds of costumes hanging from the ceiling and along shelves. There you are. I couldn't find you. I laughed and carried the bag over to her. My friends, Maybelle Donovan and Bunny Bowowski, asked me to return these for them. I slid the bag across to her. While she took them out and looked through her computer, I looked around. 
You've got every single costume imaginable in here, I noticed. We do a lot of the school's theater productions, as well as the Lexington Playhouses. They go through a lot of different costumes. She looked at me over the tip of her glasses. She looked like the thespian type. Her black hair was cut short like Twiggy. She wore a black turtleneck and black tights. How did that guy's wig turn out? Was it funny? Wig? I jerked around. What guy? What wig? Well, there was a guy that came in here, plopped down $500 to buy a used wig. She laughed. I figured since Honey Springs is so small, you might have known the guy. He said something about Honey Springs. I opened my purse and took out the Tribune. Can you tell me if it was one of these guys? I asked and handed it to her. No, neither of them. Is that you? She looked between me and the paper. Yeah, I got married that afternoon, and we celebrated at the festival. I stopped talking, wondering why I was explaining this to her. Can you tell me what he looked like? He had on a ball cap and gray jogging pants. I can't really remember any features, but he was younger than the two in the paper, she added. He said something about how his mom would think it was funny. His mom? I questioned. Did Ron Harvey have a son? There was only one way to find out. I thanked her for her time and hurried back out to my car. I pulled my phone out of my purse. Spencer, did Ron Harvey have a son? I asked him. Well, hello to you too, Roxy. There was a pause. No, he didn't have a son. Why? I went to return Bunny's costume to the shop in Lexington. I quickly told him about the conversation I'd had with the woman at the costume shop before I noticed the time. If I didn't hurry back to Honey Springs, I would be late for my dinner date with Patrick, and I couldn't let that happen. Can you text me the costume shop information, and I'll go check it out. We've got photos of all Harvey Company employees. It was a relief to hear Spencer say he'd check it out, making me for sure know that he too doubted Kami had anything to do with Ron Harvey's murder. 16. The man underneath the wig and the man that had gone to the bank with Ron had to be the same person. How was I going to find out? It was going to have to wait. It was time to let Spencer do his thing while I changed into newlywed mode. It was the least I could do for Patrick. The boardwalk was filled with the vendors that were there for the Niwala Festival. There were specialty popcorn and caramel apple vendors, and the pumpkin carving station was in front of the bean hive. Hey, Roxy. Jean Hill greeted me. Are you here to carve a pumpkin? I wish I could. I loved seeing all the kids and their parents working so hard on their pumpkins. Some were big and some were bigger. The smaller ones were being painted by the little ones. They were getting more paint on them than on the pumpkins. But I'm going on a date with my new husband. That's right. She clasped her hands. I keep forgetting, but I hear there's a big reception being planned. I hope they call you to do the flowers. I looked for a hint. Jean moved her fingers across her lips like she was zipping them. I do have some good news. Her voice was escalated. I raised over $4,000 for the bee farm in donations, and I'm still going strong. Oh, Jean. I hurried over and hugged her. She tried to push me away because she had paint all over her, but I didn't care. I was changing anyway. You're the best. Thank you. My pleasure. Do you want me to drop it by? She asked. You know, I need to get some new flowers and some of your jam for the coffee house. Why don't I stop by tomorrow? I suggested. There was no sense in her coming back to the boardwalk tomorrow if she didn't have to. According to Loretta's tight schedule, she planned to be here last night for the hay rides and today for the pumpkin carving. You're a doll. I'm just beat. She lifted her hand to her head like she was going to faint. I might put my head on my pillow tonight and not wake up for days. It's all for a good cause now, I nodded. I'll see you tomorrow. I took a stroll around the pumpkin carvers one last time before I headed back into the coffee house where Kelly was tending to the last customers of the day. It looked like she'd already restocked the salt and pepper shakers on the tables as well as the coffee and tea bars. The floors needed to be swept, and the bakery cases needed to be wiped down, but I knew she'd do those last. Ron Harvey's businessman walked into the shop right behind me with Sharon, Jimmer, and Mike. Can I help you? I asked and stepped up to the counter. 
Sassy, Pepper, and Norman danced around my ankles for attention. I've got them, Roxy, Kelly said. You go get changed. I saw Patrick walking down to the watershed, and he looked very handsome, she squealed. Oh, to be her age again, I thought. You can take their order, and I'll take their money. Truth be told, it was their fingerprints I wanted. Sure, I bet there were tons of prints on money, but if I could lift one and it matched any of the ones on the candlestick, then maybe, just maybe, we'd have a killer. Sharon, how's Bev? I asked and gave each one of the dogs a treat. I also handed Jimmer a couple of dog treats to feed the dogs. He was so cute and I hated that he was in the middle of a fight between his mother and her family. You couldn't have too many people love you and Sharon just didn't understand that. Gone, she gave me a blank stare. I hope I never see her again. Honey, we're going to have to deal with her and the company. Mike stepped up, placing his hand on her lower back. He held up two fingers. We'll get two coffees, one hot chocolate, and the last three scones you have. I looked behind me. Kelly was getting their order together. Are you the only company employees here in Honey Springs? I asked Mike. Yes, but I hear you're really trying to keep the bee farm. He reached around to his pocket and pulled out his wallet. I am. It's just that a big resort will run off the bees. I'm sure if you'd like to see other property along the lake, my mom can show you. I hand wrote their total because I didn't want it to go into the cash register. She's a realtor in town. I think we're going to stick with the bee farm. It's like a little piece of paradise and it's fun to take the ferry over. Sharon stepped up and talked over Mike. Don't worry, we'll be very neighborly. When Mike handed me the money, I knew I needed to give him change. I carefully watched where his fingers were when I took it. I'll be right back with your change. I scurried into the kitchen and grabbed a plastic bag along with a pen. I carefully drew an arrow pointing to the outside of the area where his thumb had been placed and put it into the baggie. I was going to do the same thing with the other two men, and rushed back out to the coffee house before they could pay Kelly. My change? Mike was standing at the register. Oh, that's right, duh. I giggled and opened the register, giving him change. He looked at me like I'd lost my mind, and I wanted to tell him that he was right, but I pinched a smile. Macchiato latte, the taller of the two men handed me a $10 bill. Keep the change, he nodded. I ran back into the kitchen and did the same thing with his money. When I got back to the register, all of them were staring at me. Macchiato? I questioned in a chipper voice. The shorter one handed me a ten and also told me to keep the change. Do you have this now? I asked Kelly. I do, she answered. I couldn't tell by the look on her face if she was scared or entertained, but I didn't have time to ask. Come back and see me when they're gone, I told her as I disappeared into the kitchen to change my clothes. Sassy, Pepper, and Norman all pushed through the door to look for me. I was standing over the workstation, eyeballing the three baggies labeled Mike, Tall Guy, and Short Guy. Bev has left town, which means that Spencer let her go, I wrote on the whiteboard. There was a guy that went to the costume shop to purchase a wig. He has to be the same man that went into the bank with Ron. Let's look at the fingerprints. I tapped the marker on my temple. Think, Roxy, think. I encouraged myself with my eyes closed. You didn't work your way through law school and pay it off just to forget everything you learned. Instead of writing more, I headed into the bathroom and quickly changed into a little red dress that Patrick always liked. A little fluff of hair, a swipe of lipstick, and a change into heels and I was ready to go. Did you want to see me? Kelly was standing next to the island and looking at the whiteboard. I did. Is it all locked up out there? I asked. Of course. What was it that you learned in science class about fingerprinting? I asked. It's the coolest thing. Why? She stopped after she realized I wasn't asking her just to make conversation. Does it have anything to do with these baggies of money? Yes. I know it's hard to lift prints off money. It's a long story about a client of mine when I was a lawyer. It has to do with grease on the finger and contact on the paper. I waved my hands in front of me. I need to lift their prints. You need wart cream, she said as if it were something I should have known. Wart cream? Now I was the one looking at her funny. Yeah, the way my professor explained it is the silver nitrate in the cream that infiltrates the paper. 
It reacts with the sweat in the fingerprint to make it silver chloride. You have to let it dry overnight and then expose it to ultraviolet light. Then you'll see the print. She rattled off the directions like it was the easiest thing to do. Say what? I was all sorts of confused. Okay, let's act like it's a recipe, she said. Now she was talking my language. 17. The twinkling lights draped all over the boardwalk were just as magical in the fall as they were in the summer. Or maybe it was the romantic dinner at the watershed I was getting ready to have with Patrick that sent my heart racing and filled my heart with joy. The floating restaurant was on the opposite side of the boardwalk from the marina. I loved walking by the stores along that side of the boardwalk. The knick-knack was a fun place to find unique gifts. The Walk in the Bark Pet Boutique was Pepper's absolute favorite. I'd yet to go to Touched by an Angel Spa for a treatment, but it was on my list of things to do soon. Next to the spa was the Crooked Cat, my favorite shop in Honey Springs. I'd spent a lot of time there as a child, sitting at the same front window and probably the same bean bag. Aunt Maxie would leave me there for hours when I visited each summer. Even Patrick started to hang out in there with me. He had to if he wanted to spend time with me. I'd read and he'd watch. That's when I knew he loved me. The watershed was so romantic. It had glass walls that let you take in the beauty of the lake no matter what time of day. Tonight, the stars had already started to pop out and the moon was shining brightly. It was a nice, clear autumn night, perfect for snuggling later. Good evening, the hostess smiled. You must be Roxy. I am. I was excited to hear my name, knowing Patrick had already told her to look for me. Right this way. She had me follow her through the restaurant. The tables were covered in white linens, with fancy white napkins rolled to perfection with utensils inside. It was all sorts of fancy. The votive candles in the middle of the table were the primary light source after the glass ceiling. Its automatic shades had been opened completely, letting the customers take in the magnificent view of the sky that blanketed Hunnis Springs. Miss, this way. The hostess opened the door to the outside and held it for me. Hesitant, I walked out. Patrick was standing on the bow of a cabin cruiser, dressed in a button-down shirt with a sweater over it and khakis. He had a bouquet of red roses in one hand and the other outstretched for me. Patrick, I gushed. Are we... My voice cracked when I realized he'd rented the cabin cruiser for our special dinner. We are going to eat and stay on the lake tonight. He hoisted me up on the bow and handed me the flowers. Stay on the cruiser? I asked with excitement. This had been something I wanted to do so badly since we'd started dating and gotten engaged. I know you've wanted this, and now that I'm your husband, I'm going to make sure you get everything your heart desires. He pulled me into his arms. His lips found mine, and I accepted the softest and warmest kisses that started the evening off just right. Ahem. We parted and looked to see who was staring at us. I'm sorry to interrupt, but here are the babies. Kelly was standing on the dock with Pepper on one leash and Sassy on the other. I asked Kelly to bring the dogs after he walked down so we didn't have to go back and get them. Patrick jumped down to the dock and picked them up one by one. Roxy, Spencer showed up at the last second and I got him to take Norman home for the night. There was a sneaky smile on her face. You are so good. I was thinking the same thing. I knew she, too, knew that Norman belonged with Spencer, even though Spencer didn't know it yet. Both are grouchy. Both smell in their own unique way. We all laughed. Did he say what he wanted? I asked. Don't answer that. Patrick hoisted himself up on the bow of the boat and curled his arm around my waist. We aren't talking about anything but us tonight. I'm going to leave you two to this romantic night. Kelly waved goodbye and took off. The dogs ran around for a little bit while Patrick and I enjoyed a glass of wine. The captain of the boat had untied us from the dock and glided us through the no-wake zone going the opposite direction of the boardwalk. I lay back in Patrick's arms to enjoy the slow movement of the boat. We had a big quilt laid over us to help ward off the crisp air. Sassy and Pepper had settled on a couch across from us. They'd really taken to this sibling thing. I can't believe you did this. 
My heart was overflowing with joy. This was the reason I knew I shouldn't stick my nose into Ron's murder investigation. I had everything I had ever wanted in my life on this boat. I love you, Roxanne. His warm breath tickled my ear, clashing with the cool breeze from the lake. The cruiser never came close to its top speed. The slow pace of the boat barely made any waves as it pulled into our cove. A smile swept across my face. Is this good, sir? The captain came up to the front of the boat. This is perfect. Patrick couldn't take his eyes off me. This is our cove. I know it is. Memories of us as teenagers, slipping out of church and sneaking down to the lake, played like a movie in my head. Our first kiss. It changed my life. You changed my life that summer. Patrick looked at me as if there was nothing else in this world to see. At that moment, I knew I was going to bring you back here as my wife one day. I made that promise and kept it to myself. And when you surprised me a couple of nights ago, it was all I could think about. The captain reappeared with a small cart with plates covered by silver domes on the top, middle, and bottom shelves. There was another bottle of wine chilling in a canister. He rolled it over to us. Madam, the captain had grabbed a napkin and placed it into my lap. Sir, he did the same to Patrick. He plucked the lids off the plates. Dinner is served. He plucked another two domes off. Sassy and pepper, dinner is served. <laughs> you thought of everything. I leaned over and kissed Patrick. That'll be all, Patrick told the captain. He disappeared to somewhere on the boat. Did you tell the inn that we wouldn't be there tonight? I asked Patrick while I enjoyed the amazing steak dinner he'd picked out for me. I did. I had a drink with Walker before I got here, and he's just beside himself. He mentioned you'd stop by the station and chatted with Kami. Patrick's face glowed from the light of the moon. The crickets and bullfrogs played romantic background music for us. I really don't think she did it, and I've gotten some... Patrick lifted his fork to my mouth to shut me up. I enjoyed a bite of the mashed potatoes. I get it, no talking about the murder. No, but I do have some good news. His brown eyes reminded me of the yummy chocolate mocha from the coffee house. Deep, dark, delicious. Kane Construction is donating $10,000 to the bee farm. Patrick, I gasped. That's so close to what Andrew and Kayla need to buy some new colonies. I know. That means this whole thing will be over and you can move on so we can start our life. Patrick reached over and placed his hand on mine. I told you that I'm giving you everything your heart desires, and that means no resort. And I thought that maybe you'd like to donate some of the proceeds from the sale of the cabin to add to it. The sale of my cabin? I questioned. Were you thinking of using it as a season rental? He asked with a very serious face. I wasn't going to do anything other than have us live in it. I hadn't realized until the words left my mouth that the cabin was where I wanted to stay. What about my house? he asked. I don't know. I love that house, but I don't see me owning it. Something about owning a house that Aunt Maxie loved and had to give up because of the bad economics of Hunnis Springs at the time didn't feel right. I never thought you'd feel that way. He picked up his napkin and wiped his mouth. There are a lot of things we haven't talked about that we probably should have. I could see the confusion on his face. Like, where do we want to donate? Church? Kids? Kids' education? I rattled off a few things that were sitting in the forefront of my mind. I like what we've done so far. He took my hand again. Maybe I'm a dreamer, but as issues come up, I feel confident that you and I can take them head on. Like where we're going to live? I asked. No, if you want to stay in the cabin, we can do that. He squeezed my hand before letting go. The house would be a great rental for a big family reunion or company retreat. A sigh escaped me and my heart flipped over. He stood up and helped me to stand. Thank you for picking me, Patrick Kane. I wrapped my arms around him and knew I'd be safe in them and everything would always be right in our world. 18. The next morning, the coffee house still had to open, and 4.30 a.m. came very quickly. 
When I got up to shower on the cruiser, I'd realized we'd already pulled back into the boat slip at the watershed. After a night of drinking wine and talking about our future, I fell fast asleep and never felt the boat move. Patrick, Sassy, and Pepper were still asleep, like they usually were when I left this early. I had such gratitude in my heart and knew that no matter where life took all of us, we would always be together. On my walk down the boardwalk, I turned my phone on and a text from Kelly immediately came through. She let me know that she had gone ahead and done the wart cream experiment, since she knew it would have to dry overnight. She left with instructions on how to get the fingerprints, but I had a different idea, one that Patrick wouldn't like, but it was my only option. Call my favor into Kirk. My ex, you know what. Roxy, are you okay? Kirk answered in the dead asleep voice that I'd gotten to know so well when I'd call him in the middle of the night and he'd pretend to have fallen asleep at the office when he was really down at the Motel 8 with his fling of the month. I'm fine. I put the key in the door of the coffee house and entered, flipping on the lights as I went through. In fact, I'm more than fine. I just got married. Uh, congratulations? he asked. No need to hear that from you. I'm calling in the favor you owe me. I turned on the commercial coffee pots behind the counter and made my way back into the kitchen to turn the ovens on. I don't owe you a favor. He seemed to be more alert. You owe me more than one favor. You owe me several for giving up the law practice to you and not slandering you in public by giving you a nice, quiet divorce, I reminded him. You're still a good lawyer, he told me something I already knew. What's the favor? You know your guy in the FBI and forensics? I asked and looked at the little experiment Kelly had left on the kitchen island. Yeah. I need you to meet me in Central Park in Honey Springs, around 10 this morning. I've got something I need you to take to him and have him process as soon as possible, as in yesterday. I left no room for negotiation. Roxy. Hearing Kirk call me that hurt my ears. You owe me. Ten o'clock, sharp. I ended the call and proceeded to get all my morning chores done. Before I knew it, Bunny was waddling through the door. The morning went smoothly. There was some talk about the resort and Ron's murder, but mostly it was about how beautiful the foliage had changed with the cool front that had come through. How the trees painted the most gorgeous backdrop for the cozy town. It was as if we lived inside one of those magnificent paintings that had hung in a very high-end art gallery. Bunny was all set for the next few hours. I headed out to meet Kirk in Central Park before going to Hill's Orchard to pick up the donation for the bee farm from Jean and purchase some new jams I needed for the coffee house's November goodies. Kirk was already waiting for me in the gazebo in the middle of Central Park. I made sure that I parked where no one would see me meeting with Kirk. The last thing I needed today was a phone call from Patrick about it. I would tell him, but after I'd gotten the information I needed. So you really did it. Kirk handed me the newspaper. It was already open to page six with that awesome photo of me bobbing for apples. I can't believe you did it. You look good. Thanks. It was hard for me not to give a smart comeback, but in that moment... I realized what I had in my life and was grateful for Patrick. Those feelings completely overrode any sort of animosity I had towards Kirk. Luckily, Kirk and I were never truly in love, but there was still the fact that he'd cheated, and that still really hurt. I've got all the information he needs in the packet. I handed him a big envelope that contained three baggies of money, a note to his FBI guy, and my contact information. What's this about? Kirk asked as he looked at the sealed envelope. None of your business. Just take it to him now. After this, you'll never hear from me again. I wanted to let him know that this was the last favor I'd ever ask of him. You got it. I'll text you after I drop it off to him. He took his cell phone off his belt loop. I'll call him now and take it to him before my first deposition of the morning. I'll be waiting for your text, I called over my shoulder, fully aware he was totally thinking about how he'd messed up the best thing he'd ever have in his life. No amount of cold weather was going to ruin the good mood I was in. 
I even rolled down the windows with the radio blaring and the heat on full blast as I drove the car into the deep countryside of Honey Springs on my way to Hill's Orchard. The driveway to the orchard entrance was beautiful. Jean had hay bales scattered along the sides with gourds, pumpkins, and decorative scarecrows to welcome all guests to her pumpkin patch. It was one of her busiest times of the year, and she loved it. You could tell how well her orchard was cared for. Nothing was out of place, and everything was perfectly planted. My favorite time of year at the orchard was during the early summer, when her garden popped with vibrant colors of fresh vegetables and herbs. Her beautiful garden was a big part of my home-cooked meals. Jean stood near the barn entrance, where she'd hooked up two horses to the wagon, in anticipation of all the rides they'd make to the pumpkin patch today. Hey there! She waved me over with a long carrot in her hand. The green leaves of the carrot shook. You've got everything looking so good. I grabbed one of the carrots from the tin bucket and fed it to one of the horses. I have my staff to thank. Jean was very grateful for what she had. Her husband had recently died, and she'd done a fabulous job of picking up where he left off. They've really stepped up and showed me the ropes. You didn't need much help. I wasn't going to let her get away without taking most of the credit. You make the best jam I've ever tasted. Which reminds me, I've got to go into the office for those donations. She ran a hand down one of the horses. Come on and I'll get that. We chit-chatted about the festival and how well we thought it was going. She mentioned how hard it was to keep up with the demands for pumpkin patch visits, but every night she thanked the Lord above for blessing her with so many visitors, since it was so quiet during the off-season. She truly was a remarkable part of this community, and one of the many reasons why I had to save the bee farm. All of Honey Springs' small businesses were important, and as a whole, we made this small town the best place to visit and live. I'm sorry, I didn't know anyone was here. Jean and I walked into the shop where her office was located. It was where she sold seasonal vegetables, the small gourds, and many different jams and other goods she'd canned. Jimmer had such a good time yesterday with your pumpkin carving. He wanted to go for a ride to the pumpkin patch. Mike had a big smile on his face, with his hand on his son's shoulder and Sharon by his side. That's wonderful. Jean moseyed over to the jams and picked one up. You here to get another apple pie jam? She held it up to Mike. It was good, like I said, wasn't it? I'm sorry, he asked. The apple pie jam you bought a few days ago at the farmer's market. She refreshed his memory. Farmer's market? Mike was full of all sorts of questions. Did we go to a farmer's market? He asked Sharon. She shook her head. I'm sorry, I think you have me confused with someone else. He laughed. But we'll try it. After all, we might feature it in the resort's restaurant once it's built. You do that, right, Roxy? Use the local items in your coffee house? Yeah, I said blankly. Let me get the donation for the bee farm. Jean emphasized bee farm. She nodded her head for me to follow her into the office. I know I'm old, but I swear he bought jam from me the other day. My memory isn't that bad. But he just got into town yesterday morning. I was with Sharon when he showed up. I brushed it off. Jean wasn't the youngest chicken in the coop, but she'd always had a sharp mind. But we all age. I don't like them. I don't like their resort. She handed me an envelope. I wrote one big check for the donations. It totaled $4,000. Jean, that's amazing. My eyes stung with tears. The love in this community was overwhelming. I just couldn't believe it. Now, I'm not sure how much more you need, but I'll keep collecting. She leaned over and whispered, I'll take all their money and give to the fund. <laughs> You're evil, Jean, I cackled. I guess we'd better get on that hayride. Jean called out when we walked back into the shop. There were several more customers in there now, and they'd all lined up at the register to pay. Roxy, grab what jams you need and we'll settle up later. Bye, Sharon and Jimmer, I said and looked around to say goodbye to Mike. I didn't see him. Tell Mike bye. 
I'm sure you'll see us later. Sharon didn't seem so sad today. He just got called away on business. I'll Uber back to the inn. Business? He left town? I asked. Oh, no. Sharon shook her head. He's Daddy's vice president. Hopefully president soon. He's gone to sign the papers at the bee farm. You just might be seeing a lot more of us around here. She left me standing there. Her words shook me to my core, making me dizzy. Somehow I made it back to my car and sat in the seat as the snippets of conversations over the last few days came at me like darts to a bullseye. Has Mike been here the whole time and I didn't know it? I asked myself on my way back to the car. The man at the bank and the man at the costume shop have to have been the same person. I quickly pulled up Google on my phone and Googled Sharon Harvey's marriage. Images of a much younger Sharon and Mike popped up. I took a quick screenshot and texted Evan Rich, asking if this was the guy with Ron Harvey at the bank that day. When his reply confirmed that it was, I knew I had the killer. 19. There was no time to sit there and make calls. I had to do them while driving. My insides shook. I needed confirmation from the costume store that Mike was in fact the man who had purchased the wig. At this moment, I was thrilled with hands-free technology since I had to get my phone to find and call the costume store. Hi, this is Roxy Bloom, and yesterday I returned my friend's Tweedledee and Tweedledum costumes. I didn't have to say much more. Yes, what can I do for you? she asked. I'm a lawyer working on a murder case in Honey Springs. I wasn't lying. And I would like to text or email you a photo to see if it's the man you told me about that purchased a wig. Oh no, is this about the murder of that businessman I've seen in the newspaper? she asked. Yes, and we're trying to identify the person who bought the wig. I crossed my fingers. Sure, she rattled off her phone number. I'll look at it as soon as you text it. Great. The conversation lasted just long enough for me to pull into the parking lot of the boardwalk on the marina side. I quickly sent her a text, and my phone chirped with a new text a second later. That was fast. I hit the message icon to find it was from Kirk. The prints off the money have been cross-referenced with some fingerprints sent in by Spencer Shepard of Honey Springs. One matched a Mike Hogan. His prints are on money from you and whatever it was Spencer Shepard was looking at. My heart raced, my palms began to sweat, and my fingers started to shake. Copy, paste. Hearing my voice calmed me down as I copied Kirk's message into a text to Spencer. I'm going to the bee farm right now because Mike Hogan is signing the paperwork to purchase it, and I'm going to stop him. It's been confirmed that he was the guy who purchased the wig from the costume shop and was seen at the bank with Evan Rich. I threw my phone down in the passenger seat of my car and jumped out. Big! Big Bib! I screamed, practically running over all the tourists who were enjoying candy apples and popcorn. Big! I screamed, running along the dock of the marina. What's all this ruckus? Big Bib threw open the door to the shop. I need you to take me to the bee farm, I said as I huffed and puffed. I bent over to catch my breath. Killer! There! I couldn't make a complete sentence. Ferry went back over there about ten minutes ago and it isn't back. He shrugged like it was no big deal. I jumped up to standing, grabbed a fistful of the front of his bibbed overalls, and jerked him closer. That man over there, he is the killer, and he can't sign the paperwork to buy the bee farm. My eyes met Bibbs. No one ever touched or treated him that way. It was probably a dumb thing to grab him. If you've gone to the extreme of putting your own life in danger by grabbing me, then you must be serious. He pointed to a speedboat tied to the dock. Jump in my boat. I'll grab the keys. What was mere seconds seemed like minutes. As soon as the speedboat pulled up to the dock at the bee farm, I leapt out of the boat, screaming like a madwoman. At least, that's what the tourists who'd gone over for the honey tasting must have thought, given their expressions. Kayla! Andrew! Don't sign those papers! I continued to scream until I got to the building which held their store and offices. 
Through a glass window, I could see the three of them leaning over a table. Mike had a pen in his hand and was signing the contract. No! I screamed so loud I nearly went deaf. The three of them looked up. Mike's eyes met mine, and he tugged a grin across his lips. He shoved the pen in Andrew's hand, and from what I could see, he must have told Andrew to sign. He hasn't signed yet, I said with a sigh of relief. I ran to the door and flung it open. Andrew, don't sign! I held my hand out and had to bend over again for breath. My heart was pumping so fast that my body couldn't keep up. Have you had too much coffee? Kayla joked. He, I pointed to Mike, he, he killed. Don't listen to her. She's ridiculous. Mike dismissed me. Everything's fine. Sign the papers, Andrew. You don't have to. He is going to jail, and the fundraiser has raised at least $14,000, and that'll get you started with a few new colonies. I stood up and heaved in a deep breath, gathering my wits. We can continue raising money to save the farm. Sign the papers. Mike didn't sound so certain about this deal now. Andrew, maybe we should... Kayla started to say, just as Mike grabbed the letter opener and pulled her against him, holding it up to her neck. Sign the papers, Andrew, or this goes right into her carotid artery. You could see the pointy end making an indentation in Kayla's neck where Mike was pushing it further and further in. Suddenly, the sounds of a gunshot and a whipping rope hurled past me toward Mike and Kayla. Kayla scrambled as Mike Hogan went down, grabbing his leg and calling out in pain. I jerked around. Big Bib was standing behind me with a spear gun pointed directly at Mike. The sound of water police sirens echoed in the air. I could have shot him in the heart and killed him, but I think he doesn't deserve to get off that easy. Big Bib smiled under his beard, a rare thing to see. He needs to go play with the boys in jail for the rest of his life. Moments later, Spencer Shepard and a slew of police officers stormed the island, taking Mike Hogan into custody. You did good, Roxy. Spencer walked me back to Bibb's speedboat. We were in the process of trying to get fingerprints from all of Harvey Company employees, but you beat us to the punch. You know, it was high school science and an ex-husband that got us here, I joked, getting back on the boat, leaving him standing there scratching his head. I looked over at the police speedboat. I like your deputy there. Norman was sitting in the boat, and I swear the dog had a smile on his face. Yeah, I think he's mine. Spencer cocked a smile. Come on by, and I'll help you fill out the paperwork. I sat down in the seat and prepared for Bib to take me back to the boardwalk. I'll put on a fresh pot of coffee. 20. What's going on over at the bee farm? Aunt Maxie walked into the coffee house, the leaves rustling below her feet. The temperature had turned downright bitter as it swept along the lake and knocked what was left of the leaves off the trees. Let me get you a coffee while you get out your notepad, because I've got your article for next week's sticky situation. I'd been sitting at the bar, watching across the lake while Spencer did the cop thing. I'd gotten back from the bee farm and knew I needed to go back to the coffee house for the rest of the afternoon before Kelly got here for her shift. Pepper and Sassy needed to be walked and fed. On our walk, we stopped at my car to get the jars of apple pie jam, my phone, and my purse. Sassy and Pepper sniffed all along the boardwalk on our way back to the coffee house. It gave me time to call my husband to let him know that I'd be home at our cabin cooking supper when he got off work. I was at peace with all of my decisions. Helping out with solving Ron Harvey's murder and getting married before the festival and picking the cabin as our home. The sense of calm swept over me. I took another look across the lake where the bee farm was still buzzing with excitement. Before Aunt Maxie had come in, I'd made new pots of coffee, knowing the regulars would be in to gossip. Sharon! I was shocked to see Sharon and Jimmer walk back into the coffee house. I'm, I'm, I couldn't find the words. There's no need to explain to me. I should have seen it coming. 
She waved her hand no when I picked up the pot and offered her a coffee. Jimmer and I are going to this cute little town we found the other day, tucked in a really remote wooded area. She bent down to Jimmer. Why don't you go pet Sassy and Pepper goodbye? I'm sorry. I really am. I felt horrible for her, but I was glad she wasn't talking cruelly to Jimmer like she had done before. I shouldn't be surprised. Mike and my father never liked each other. I thought they'd made amends and my dad had decided to give him a job. We were all shocked when my dad had announced he'd hired Mike back as his vice president. She shook her head. I had no idea Mike was blackmailing my father about some shady business dealings. I thought Mike wanted the family back together and was doing all he could. It all boiled down to money. My father is dead because he made poor business choices and Mike wanted money to keep them a secret. The coffee house door opened and Bev walked in. She waved something in her hand and Sharon nodded. I've even asked Bev to stay on with the company. She and Bev hugged, shocking me how fast all of this had transpired, though I should have seen it. Things in the business world outside of Honey Springs moved very quickly. It was something I was glad to put behind me when I stopped being a lawyer. This is from us. Sharon handed me an envelope. We heard you got married before Ron's murder in the same room. Bev offered a smile. I just feel like your wedding memories will be tainted with Ron's murder. You know that cute little town I was telling you about? The one we are going to visit today? Sharon asked. Well, they've got this adorable resort in the woods where you stay in a tree house. There's a honeymoon suite. It's called Full Moon Tree Sort in Whispering Falls, Kentucky. Whispering Falls, Kentucky? I asked, not knowing the place. Yes, they've got the cutest shops. I really think you're going to love a charming cure where the owner makes and sells her own homeopathic products. She opened the brochure she had of the town. We've paid for a week's stay for you and Patrick. It's the least we could do for ruining your wedding. I can't take this, I protested. Yes, she can. Aunt Maxie grabbed the envelope from me. We'll make sure of it. I better put on another pot of coffee. I looked around at my new friends and took in a deep sigh of satisfaction. There was nothing that went better with friends than gossip and coffee. Afterwards, a huge thank you to all y'all who keep Roxy and the gang of the Killer Coffee Mystery Series alive. Thank you to my Facebook followers who show up every day and read my posts. Some people say they don't like social media, but for me, as a writer, I love it because I get to interact with my readers. If you don't follow me on Facebook, come on by and click here so we can connect. I'd love to have you as part of my personal team. I get many questions about my love of coffee. I'm happy to report that it's true. I'm probably addicted to it, and it's the first thing I grab in the morning, afternoon, and evening, and any other minute of the day. In fact, I can actually drink decaffeinated and be just as happy. I think it's the warmth outside of the taste that I love. Just like Roxy, there's nothing more fun to me than sitting around a table gabbing with my family and friends over a hot steaming cup of coffee. Can you believe that Roxy and Patrick got married? I mean, really? I never saw that coming. I truly didn't. I only plot the murder, victim, and suspects along with the motive before I sit down to write. The characters take over while I'm getting to those points, and I have to say that Roxy was begging to become Mrs. Patrick Kane without all the drama from Penny and Aunt Maxie. There's nothing at all like drama at a southern wedding. That's not the only thing that you're going to see of their wedded bliss. I'm so excited to be bringing you a fun crossover mystery combining two of my favorite series, the Magical Cure Mystery Series and a Killer Coffee Series. A Charming Blend is a holiday short story that will bring the magical town of Whispering Falls into the folds of the magical beans served at the Bean Hive in Honey Springs. The short story will be included in a holiday boxed set. You can click here to learn about the box set and purchase it. In case you've never read any of the Magical Cures mystery series, scroll past the recipes and read an excerpt from the very first book in the series, A Charming Crime. I'm sure you're going to love June Heal and her magical gifts in this fun crossover. If you've not ever read the Magical Cures mystery series, you can grab book one for free on Amazon. 
Also, you can stay connected with weekly giveaways on my newsletter, Tuesday Coffee with Tanya, by signing up at tanyacappas.com. Recipes made and served at the Bean Hive. Salted Caramel Coffee. Ingredients. 8 tablespoons ground coffee. 4 tablespoons caramel syrup. 4 tablespoons half and half. Dash of sea salt. Instructions. Size. 1 pot of 12 cups of coffee. Brew. Classic. Following the measurements provided, place the ground coffee into the brew basket. Place caramel syrup half and half, and salt into a mug. Set mug in place to brew. When brew is complete, stir to combine. Halloween Pumpkin Oatmeal Spice Dog Treat Recipe Makes 20 cookies. Ingredients Half cup canned pumpkin Half cup water Two tablespoons olive oil Half teaspoon cinnamon Half cup oatmeal Two and a half cups whole wheat flour. Instructions. One, preheat oven to 375 degrees. Two, combine pumpkin, oil, water, and cinnamon in a large bowl and stir well. Three, gradually mix in oatmeal and flour to form stiff dough. Four, roll dough to quarter inch thick and cut with cookie cutters on floured surface. Five, bake on non-stick cookie sheet for 30 to 40 minutes. Bean and ham soup. Ingredients. One pound dry Great Northern beans. Eight cups water. Half teaspoon salt. One ham hock. One cup chopped carrots. Half stalk celery. One cup chopped onion. One teaspoon minced garlic. 1 teaspoon mustard powder, 2 cups chopped ham, half teaspoon ground white pepper. Directions. Rinse the beans, sorting out any broken or discolored ones. In a large pot over high heat, bring the water to a boil. Add the salt in the beans and remove from heat. Let beans sit in the hot water for at least 60 minutes. After the 60 minutes of soaking, return the pot to high heat and place the ham bone, carrots, celery, onion, garlic, and mustard in the pot. Stir well, bring to a boil, reduce heat to low, and simmer for 60 more minutes. Remove ham bone and discard. Stir in the chopped ham and simmer for 30 more minutes. Season with ground white pepper to taste. Lunch Lady Brownies Ingredients 1 cup butter, melted half cup cocoa, one cup light brown sugar, one cup white sugar, four eggs, one tablespoon vanilla extract, two cups all-purpose flour, gluten-free alternative, one and one-third cup brown rice flour, half cup tapioca starch, third cup potato starch. Frosting ingredients, quarter cup butter softened, three cups powdered sugar, quarter cup cocoa, quarter teaspoon kosher salt, quarter cup milk. Directions. Preheat the oven to 350 degrees. Grease a 9 by 13 baking pan or line with parchment paper. In a large mixing bowl, whisk together the butter, cocoa, brown sugar, and white sugar. Add the eggs and the vanilla. Whisk again until smooth. Add the flour and stir until combined. Pour into the prepared pan and use a spatula to spread the thick batter to the corners. Bake for 22 to 24 minutes until a toothpick comes out with moist crumbs. While the brownies are baking, make the frosting. In a mixing bowl, combine the butter, the powdered sugar, the cocoa, and the salt. Beat with an electric mixer for one to two minutes until combined. It will be mostly dry crumbs. Add the milk and beat again for one to two minutes until smooth and creamy. Remove the brownies from the oven and let cool for just a few minutes. Gently spread the frosting over the brownies while they are still quite warm. Let cool before slicing. Enjoy! Note, frost the brownies while they are still warm. 
the frosting will melt down a bit into the brownies, creating an irresistible crust. Apple Pie Jam Mix 6 half pints Ingredients About 8 to 10 mixed, firm, crisp apples 2 tablespoons lemon juice 1 teaspoon ground cinnamon 1 teaspoon ground ginger 1 eighth teaspoon ground nutmeg 1 box pectin 4 cups white sugar 1 cup firmly packed dark brown sugar Half a teaspoon of butter Peel and finely dice the apples. Pack them firmly into a four cup measuring cup. Add water in between all the apple pieces to fill the four cups. Put the apples, water, lemon juice, and spices in the preserving pan and sprinkle the pectin over the fruit. Stir well. Bring the mixture to a full rolling boil that cannot be stirred down. Add both sugars, Stir well and bring back up to a full rolling boil for exactly one minute. Do not stop stirring. Remove from heat. Stir in the pinch of butter to reduce the foam. Skim off any foam that remains. Ladle into hot, clean jars, leaving quarter-inch head space. Wipe the jar rims and threads. Cover with lid and ring. Process in boiling water for 10 minutes. This has been Decaffeinated Scandal, a killer coffee mystery series. Written by Tanya Kappas. Narrated by Christina Sagnameni. Copyright 2018 by Tanya Kappas. Production copyright by Tanya Kappas.